Smith alongside Brad Smith. This is Yahoo Finance's flagship show, The Morning Brief, the ultimate guide to help investors make smarter decisions for their portfolio. We're tracking early session volume while bringing today's top market themes and elevating Yahoo Finance's most popular newsletter. That's right. We've got a busy show this Wednesday, hump day morning. Stock futures slipping ahead of the crucial PCE inflation reading. That's going to guide investor hopes for interest rate cuts. Major indices taking a backseat to Bitcoin. The cryptocurrency breaking 60,000 just within striking distance of some new all-time highs. And retail earnings giving investors a better read on the consumer. Results out from eBay, TJX, Urban Outfitters, and Warby Parker showing once again that consumers are thinking twice before buying and in some cases trading down. So let's get right to it with the three things that you need to know your roadmap for the trading day. Yahoo Finance's Josh Schaefer, Jared Blickery, and Dan Howley have more. Yeah, Shauna, futures retreating this morning, coming off Tuesday's mixed close as investors await Thursday's crucial inflation report. The latest reading on personal consumption expenditures, widely known as the Federal Reserve's preferred inflation gauge, will help traders search for clues about the potential timing of a Fed interest rate cut. Meanwhile, though, enthusiasm for the world's largest cryptocurrency is reaching a level last seen during its 2021 boom. Bitcoin breaking 60,000, putting it within striking distance of its all-time highs. And retail earnings are occupying investors' attention this morning. TJ Maxx parent TJX posting better-than-expected sales in its fiscal fourth quarter, with same-store sales jumping 5% thanks to those holiday deals. The department store did, however, issue weaker guidance. TJX also announced its plan to repurchase approximately $2 billion to $2.5 billion of stock in fiscal 2025. And Apple is reportedly pulling the plug on its plans of building electric vehicles. For the last decade, the iPhone maker was rumored to be spending billions of dollars on the project, which initially called for a fully autonomous car before being scaled back to a vehicle with advanced safety features. The team consisted of 2,000 employees, many of whom will be moved to the iPhone maker's artificial intelligence division, according to Bloomberg. Well, our top story today, stock futures edging slightly lower, but we're not seeing a lot of movement this morning. Ahead of Thursday's key PCE, personal consumption expenditures report, but one area seeing a lot of gains today, it's crypto. Bitcoin breaking above 60,000 here. There you're taking a look at BTC, USD, the cryptocurrency has been on a tear this week. Now standing in striking distance of its all time high. Of course, we still got a little work to do to get there. 68,000 is the marker. Yahoo Finance's Josh Schaefer joins us on set to talk about the implications of the rally. Hey, Josh. Right, we've been talking FOMO rally for a while now, yeah. right? And yeah. people just sort of looking for places to potentially earn money and maybe earn money quick. And that has sort of always been part of Bitcoin's story, right? And I think we're kind of seeing that right now when we see Bitcoin at its highest level since 2021, since we really had that face ripper of a rally where Bitcoin reached almost 70,000 back in that pure euphoria. It's interesting to see Bitcoin enter the rally at this moment, I think, right? We've seen the AI plays surge over the last couple of weeks. We've seen NVIDIA surge on what most people would argue is a real fundamental story. And then some other AI names that sort of surround NVIDIA, or I'll call out maybe SoundHound here over the last couple of days, catching a massive bid, right? And a lot of volatility in that stock, been interesting to watch. You had two companies yesterday essentially mention that they might someday benefit from GLP-1s, which again, I think is a real fundamental story. But the moves we saw in Viking Therapeutics and the, and the other therapeutics company that took a big move most people would probably argue are a little bit beyond where maybe the fundamental story is there. Take a look at that two-day gain of over 120%. So I'm, I'm, I'm not shocked, right? Of, of course Bitcoin is getting in on this fund and people are just maybe trying to I don't know, go risk on. They, yeah, they certainly are, especially <laughs> in some of those off. plays that you just highlighted there. But Josh, I think the question that so many investors are asking here at home and one that the three of us has ta have talked about time and time again is just in terms of the, that bubble-like comparison that we have heard numerous times on the street, even some of strategists who have come on the show now saying that some of the levels that we're seeing, especially in certain stocks, is bubble-like territory. But what does that mean, though, to the broader market and whether or not this rally or the thought process behind whether or not this rally can be sustained? It's been interesting because you hear different things from different strategists, right? There's sort of the advice of maybe it is bubble-like, and that sort of means that you 
can't afford to not be in it or at least be in some of the bigger names. And a lot of people have said that with a stock like NVIDIA, right? Or some of the MAG7 stocks where it's, maybe they're getting closer to bubble territory, but mm -hmm. the earnings story is also there and the earnings projections as we talked about yesterday are there for some of those stories. It is when we talk about something like Bitcoin or we talk about something like the smaller AI plays, I feel like fewer and fewer people that we have on the show are making a real fundamental base case to potentially support that. And one thing, Sean, on valuations too that stuck out to me, we were highlighting this yesterday on the show, there was a great chart from Capital Economics talking about valuations we see right now in tech and valuations we see outside of tech. Interesting when we think bubble, how not stretched we are mm -hmm. from a valuation standpoint. If we're talking about strictly forward price to earnings ratio here, which could mean it's the early days of the bubble, right? Remember, we first started talking about the bubble in say 1996. Mm -hmm. The bubble didn't burst for several more years, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. as you said, that remains, that leaves us with the key question of what does that really mean? Yeah. If I had that answer. Everyone's trying to figure it out. If, yeah. if we all had that answer, but we I, might not be here. Right, but I also think it goes back to what you were saying just in terms of the fundamentals of so many of those mm. key companies. When you take into a, uh, take into account NVIDIA and what we've seen from so many of those very large and strong tech companies, it's extremely different what we're seeing today versus what we saw back in 2000 and 2001. So those comparisons, mm -hmm. and City's going to join us, uh, strategist from City's going to join us later on in the hour, talk a little bit more about that and why they actually are one of those, one of the strategists out on the street who don't see or don't think that comparison really makes sense at this point. Yeah, absolutely. Just one more figure to toss out there. 2.5, 2.5 trillion is one of the markers that's out there. Lawrence Latimer joined us in December of 2023, breaking down that for the entire crypto and coin market cap here. If we get back to that by the end of 2025, certainly Bitcoin is going to be one of the major stories that's within that. So we'll have to check back in with Lawrence just a little bit later on. Josh, though, helping us break down some of the FOMO trade right now. <laughs> Josh, appreciate it. Let's switch gears. We've seen some big moves in retail this morning as investors digest results from Urban Outfitters, eBay, and TJX. Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery is here for a deeper dive into those moves. Hey, Jared. Hey Brad, we're take, checking out the retail landscape here with our heat map and the background colors, by the way, that's yesterday's price action. What I'm tracking is in those little red boxes at the bottom, Urban Outfitters down 10.72% right now. Also big five off earnings down about 9%. And I thought it'd be interesting to chart some of the longer term price action here. Here's Urban Outfitters up 32% year to date. You can see over the last 10 years, it's been here several times before, but now finally seems to be breaking out. And then eBay, not really uh, as related to retail as some of the other names are, but still in that payment space. We're seeing a lot of spikes over the last few years, but it's been a consistent downtrend. And the fact that it's still mired in the downtrend in the bottom end of its range there makes me think that this company might have a little bit more time to get back to its record highs than a lot of these other companies. Finally, TJX, what an incredible run over the last two years, up 50%. Guys, back to you. All right, Jared, thanks so much. Uh, well, the latest earnings results from retailers giving us that inside look into the state of the consumer. So let's break down some key takeaways, starting with the state of department yeah. stores. So we heard from Macy's earlier this week. This is one of our big takeaways that we have been tracking throughout this earnings season, and especially with retailers. And Macy's particularly came to mind here because of some of the weakness. Morningstar equity analyst David Swartz joined us this week, and he said, at this point, it's hard to have a lot of confidence at all on Macy's turnaround plan, and it's a massive turnaround plan. It layoffs, restructuring plan, and then additionally closing 150 stores. This is just the start of Tony Springs' tenure over at Macy's. It certainly is, and I think it highlights some of the struggles that we're seeing play out beyond Macy's yeah. into other parts within the sector. We've talked for a long time about Nordstrom, the fact that that company's struggling. When you take a look at Kohl's, so many of these larger players within the department store space, they're trying to right-size the ship right now, trying to adjust their business for what the consumer consumer wants and needs at this point. A lot of that means more heavily investing in online. When you take a look at rivals, obviously Walmart and Amazon, that was one of the uh, strategic moves laid out from Macy's new CEO, Tony Spring, just in terms of some of the investment there and what they plan to do in fulfillment centers. So until that transition takes place, you can expect some of these department store names to remain under pressure. The second trend that we want to point out here when it comes to the consumer and really giving us a good look as to how shoppers are feeling 
right now is the rise in popularity of the private label products. Now, this is a trend that we have been talking about now over the last couple of quarters, and it is continuing here into this quarter. Even uh, just earlier this week, Target coming out announcing a brand new uh, private label line that most of their products are going to be in the range of $1 to $10. And why we're pointing this out is because, yes, inflationary pressures have eased just a bit, but still clearly shoppers are feeling the pain of higher prices, and they're forced to make some of these adjustments as a result. And that's all part of the value consciousness yeah. that a lot of shoppers are deploying right now. And when you think about some of those private label brands and the broader kind of play into that trade down type of mindset, that's exactly where companies like TJ, well, um, Sarge, I should yeah. say, or Target, and then additionally Walmart, where we've heard them continue to lean into some of those brands that are homegrown. Finally here, though, we got to talk about a little bit of luxury. It's a little luxury, though. Just very little. <laughs> it comes out in a couple different formats here, particularly in that beauty category, the, cos the cosmetics category as well. And I'll harken back to Macy's just once again, because that was one of the bright spots, mm -hmm. actually, of their report. Blue Mercury, one bright spot in the Macy's earnings this week. Poised for acceleration, the CEO said. Over the next three years as well, they're anticipating about 30 Blue Mercury store openings, remodel roughly 30 others as well. And then you think about where else this has played out within the little luxuries landscape. It's ELF, ELF, everyone. And that ticker symbol has been rocketing over the past year, up 170%, 44% higher year to date. They reported earnings. They raised guidance. They also have three consecutive periods of doing so here. So that's another name that's been on the minds of a lot of analysts out there. Yeah, and TJX was one of the uh, companies that was out uh, before the bell this morning. And they are seeing spending on some of the cosmetics, those types of uh, purchases that really have outperformed over the last couple of quarters. And you've got a lot of people asking whether or not the beauty industry is relatively recession-proof when you compare it to some of the spending trends that we've seen uh, more broadly within the sector. All right, we'll keep it right here on Yahoo Finance. Much more coming up. One of those tickers that we will be talking about is Beyond Meat. Shares are skyrocketing on positive signs from its earnings report, to say the least. You're looking at a gain of 60%. More on that when we come back. Apple's long-rumored entry into the EV space has reportedly been scrapped. According to Bloomberg, the tech giant is and its electric vehicle division that it spent a decade of time building billions of dollars and put over 2,000 workers on is being sunset or at least reallocated. So what should the company 
with almost $40 billion in operating cash flow, be spending its money on now. We've got our very own Dan Halley here with more. So, Dan, where, where should they put this money to work? They should give it to me, and that's the end of the segment, and <laughs> I'll see you. No, uh, so they should, uh, th there's a few things here, right? And I think, you know, obviously the car uh, idea was pretty high in the sky, I think, for, for a lot of people. Apple getting into the car business, it would have been massive, uh, but you've seen the struggles that Tesla's obviously gone through, Rivian uh, and the like. And so, you know, with EV uh, sales kind of falling off, it, it makes sense. So the three things that I think they should start to, to focus more on is obviously innovating more on the iPhone. Uh, this is something that they're going to have to continue to ride as their primary device. It's still the one that gets everybody in stores. And then there's the add-ons that get people to stick around, the, the, the uh, Apple Watch, the AirPods, all of those things. The other is obviously, and this is something that was in the report, generative AI. Generative AI is not the end-all, be-all you know, panacea for all text problems, but uh, it is a way that they can uh, innovate for themselves, uh, perhaps provide better services, uh, uh, a better experience on the iPhone. We don't know what that's gonna look like yet, though Tim Cook did say that they are looking closely at AI, uh, 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 generative AI and investing there. And the other is growing their services business. Right now, uh, services is a bright spot for them. Uh, whenever you buy Apple Care, whenever you sign up for Apple TV Plus, Apple Music Plus, I'm on Spotify, um, <laughs> it is something that feeds into that uh, area. And so they can continue to build that out. Uh, you know, they're working with sports, obviously, with MLS. Uh, we'll see uh, if they can expand their MLB um, uh, partnership. Maybe they'll start showing the Mets because YouTube TV canceled SNY, uh, which I have a bone to pick with Google about. Uh, but uh, I think that's really where they're, they're, they need to focus. I mean, look, the, the iPhone is a great device, but how many people are stoked every year that it comes out. It's, it's the hype gets less and less and less. It's more begrudgingly that you have to actually update your iPhone. Yeah, because it's less. The, yeah, it's it's no longer like, man, I can't wait to get it. And it's yeah. like, oh, a new one's coming out. Cool. What does this one do? Right. Uh, I'll hold off for two years. Yeah. Dan, I think the question though for analysts at least is now that they are not any longer spending money on the EV business, they're reallocating those funds. What does that though tell us about potential competition and Apple's ability then? to compete with the companies that are very much viewed as a leader within the AI space? Well, I think, look, you know, obviously it's Microsoft, it's Google, uh, Meta, uh, Amazon. You know, Amazon doesn't advertise their AI as much, but, I mean, they've, they've been in this space for, for quite a while with AWS. But uh, I think, you know, Apple, with their huge, you know, uh, chest of treasure, uh, otherwise known as a treasure chest, uh, they'll be able to go ahead and, and hire the right people and start working this out uh, in a way that brings some form of generative AI yeah. to everybody's uh, iPhones, iPads, Macs, you know, what have you. What it looks like, though, I think is, is still up in the air. You know, we've seen Google and Samsung roll out some features for smartphones. It's, it's largely with, you know, photos. Uh, there's some where you can change the uh, tone of your text messages. Right. Uh, that's not a killer app to me. It's also mm -hmm. not really important. Uh, so I think, you know, it, it remains to be seen where that is. And I think, you know, we, we talk so much about generative AI, but I think that's part of the problem is we don't, ChatGPT blew everyone away. Right. Okay, cool. What are you going to do now? Mm -hmm. sure. what, what's going to be the product that gets me to want to buy a new iPhone because of generative AI? Yeah. I haven't seen anyone really do that yet. Yeah, all right. Apple's big question to answer here. Dan, thanks so much for breaking that down. Moving right along here, one of the trending tickers that we're tracking here today, ticker symbol BYND, Beyond Meat shares skyrocketing after cost-cutting measures and promises of less discounting dominated the company's latest earnings call. The plant-based meat leader and meat maker also teases potential actions coming to reduce debt and shore up its cash position. Yahoo Finance's Executive Editor Brian Sazi joins us with a serving of analysis here. Uh, I held back. From what serving I was of say. analysis. No, no, don't like hold it. back. Don't hold back. Just let it fly. We're talking plant-based meat here, but really, yeah. uh, this I should say. Some of the gains have been given back since last night. Beyond shares were up close to 100 percent 
uh, as soon as those earnings hit the wires. So we're seeing a little bit of a, a sell-off, uh, should I say, in the pre-market. But again, an eye-popping gain, top ticker on the Alpha Finance platform. So let me decode, uh, I think, what investors are seeing with this stick, uh, this uh, ticker today. One, massive short covering rally here with Beyond. You go to the uh, Beyond Meat ticker page on Yahoo Finance, click on stats, scroll down, and you'll see that massive short position that looks like it's getting unwound. Question you have to ask yourself, why is this getting unwound? Couple reasons. Uh, the company has cut a lot of expenses in this year, notably the second half of this year, you may not see a lot of losses from Beyond Meat. They might actually start making money again, which is a really good thing if you're a public company or any company in general. Next, uh, they did tease price hikes coming on new Beyond Meat burgers. Now, I talked to Ethan Brown just a couple days ago about that product. Uh, it's a product he's very jazzed up about. I think that's going to start shipping in April, potentially at higher prices. The street really likes that because Beyond has been discounting its products, has hammered margins the past year and a half. And then also lastly, and this is something uh, I dug a little more into, and to be perfectly honest, I need to dig more into it, they're eyeing a potential balance sheet boost in 2024. Now, the company said, now on the company's balance sheet, uh, they have about $1.1 billion in convertible notes. They took out that debt, guys, in 2021 when the, the stock was uh, absolutely near its peak, things were hot. That note comes due in 2027. Uh, and there's some concern on the street about liquidity for Beyond Meat. They exited last year with about $190 million in cash. How are they going to meet that debt obligation? It is unclear what they're going to do uh, regarding uh, raising or boosting their balance sheet. Uh, that's the mood on the street here this morning. But the mood, it seems to be they might raise cash and buy back that debt. Unclear, but it's something to watch. It could be a major catalyst or a stock driving catalyst for Beyond Meat. But I mentioned before some of the, uh, the cost cutting that Beyond Meat has done. And I think this is a very important quote here by uh, co-founder and CEO Ethan Brown on the earnings call last night. Really, I think, highlighting to investors how deep this company has gone. Uh, they have used to deal with 13 co-packers or companies or manufacturing sites that made their products for them. They're now down to one. Now, that is a likely to lead to a massive improvement in profit margins, but also improve the product quality on a product that is just fundamentally made different than meat. So a lot to be, uh, a lot to be uh, taken in here from this company. The street, three underperform ratings reiterated on the street. So you have a lot of non-believers still on Beyond Meat. Justifiably so. I mean, the stock is really down, I think, 95% using this stock price right now here uh, in the pre-market compared to those highs from 2019. I think it was $239 a share. But still, um, I think just a massive short covering rally because there were signs, incremental signs of positive things finally yeah. happening, happening at this company. Now they just have to deliver it to the street. Yeah, certainly forecasts of better margins there, revenue beat, the realignment that we've seen within their product portfolio, certainly giving investors a reason I to like buy the meatballs, today. Shana. I like the food. They're good. They are it good. Works. I know. I'm one works. of those believers in Beyond Meat. But we'll see whether or not the share price holds <laughs> up. <matter. laughs> All right, Thanks. Well, let's talk a little bit more about the consumer, some of the trends that we are seeing this time, though, within the retail space specifically. And one of those trends is that consumers continue to trade down as inflation remains sticky. TJX reporting same-store sales rising 5% from a year ago in its fourth quarter results and also saying that it plans to raise its dividend by 13% in fiscal 2025. The better than expected results here, the reason why we're seeing that stock move slightly to the upside ahead of the open is because many of those consumers are trading down to those off-price retailers. So let's talk about that landscape with Corey Tarlow. He's an analyst with Jeffries. Corey, it's great to see you here. I'm curious to get your reaction to the numbers that we're getting out here from TGX this morning and what that tells us about the larger trend that we're seeing play out right now within the retail space. Sure. Thank you for having me on and, and good morning. So what I would say is that, number one, the consumer has been largely much more resilient than I think we had expected. Um, there's been relatively low unemployment. There's been relatively strong um, spend in, in, in categories like and in, in channels like off price retail, specifically in apparel. And the company has seen really great momentum in traffic. So you pointed out what was a 5% same store sales gain. That's predominantly, if not entirely, driven by an increase in foot traffic. So at a time when inflation's been up, call it 3 to 4%, uh, the sales gains have entirely been driven by new people coming into the store and existing shoppers going to TJ Maxx more often. That's a really great sign. Um, for the fundamentals of this business. And uh, the guide was very strong. The company talked about gift giving. 
being a highlight in the fourth quarter. And as you mentioned, they also raised the dividend and talked about, I think, a two to two and a half billion dollar buyback. So this company generates a lot of revenue, a lot of margin and a lot of cash flow that they can then return to shareholders. Does that make them then the prime portfolio play for a value conscious consumer or value hacking environment that consumers are currently in right now? We certainly think so. Um, it's one of our top picks within large cap alongside Walmart and Costco, and the, the stocks perform very nicely. So uh, we do see continued outperformance here, and, and the fundamentals that, that we've continued to observe all throughout 2023 and into 2024 so far have been very, very strong according to the data that we track with traffic again, um, driving a majority of the comp sales gains. So we really are very encouraged by what we're seeing alongside uh, the strong sales trends. You've now seen a return to growth in home goods now for the last few quarters. That's helped to unlock a little bit better margin. They've had lower freight expense, also cited lower shrink and lower promotions. So everything seems to be trending in the right direction for this business at present. Corey, more broadly, when we think about the resilience of the consumer and, the, and that narrative that, that has continued on, how resilient is the consumer, especially if we're looking across the prices that are actually being realized or where there are deep discounts that consumers still continue to look for right now? Sure. Um, I think that this is really emblematic if you take a look at the TJ Maxx results today or if you look at the Walmart results from um, last week. I think that you continue to see value-oriented retailers with attractive price points um, that sell not only things that you need but also things that you want um, are, are, are really trending quite well right now from a, a sales and a traffic perspective. And you're seeing also some upward margin trajectory, too. So that in and of itself tends to be conducive to upward earnings revisions, which is a really great reason to buy stocks um, in retail. So that, I think, based on the underlying trends that we've seen thus far in the fourth quarter and quarter to date, um, are really emblematic of, again, a continued upside for um, Walmart and also TJ Maxx. Corey, when it comes to some of those broader trends that we're seeing in terms of where people are spending money, yes, they are trading down. But one of the categories that, are, that has remained relatively resilient is the beauty category, is cosmetics. Is that something that you think is going to buck that downward trend and remain strong here for the remainder of 2024? It's a great question. And it's certainly a category that TJ Maxx has talked about being quite strong. And in, and in fact, if you go into some of their newer stores, the newer remodeled stores, um, what you'll see is a, a brighter section with new fixtures. You might even see some greater square footage allocated toward the category. Uh, and you'll see some new brands as well. So I think that what TJ Maxx and other companies like Target with its partnership with Ulta have recognized is that there's a lot of opportunity in this category. Um, it helps to drive trip frequency because it's a consumable type product, but it has a non-consumable type margin. So it actually helps to benefit profitability. Corey, always a pleasure to get some of your insights and your analysis. Uh, thanks so much for taking the time here this morning. Appreciate it. Corey Tarlow. Thanks. All right. First, solar stock. We're tracking that this morning as well. It's climbing. This comes after the solar panel maker raised its guidance in the fourth quarter earnings report this week. For more on this, we've got Yahoo Finance reporter Inez Ferre. Hey, Inez. Yeah, Brad, and uh, First Solar is the U.S.'s largest solar panel manufacturer. It makes panels here in the U.S., so it benefits greatly from the Inflation Reduction Act. It is allowed to sell tax credits to other companies. Last year, it sold almost $700 million to a fintech company. It's also benefiting from demand stemming from big energy developers. Keep in mind that some of the customers that First Solar has includes Light Source BP, Next Era Energy. This is more on the utility side. And that really differentiates this company from other companies in the solar space that gear more towards the commercial or residential side. With respect to First Solar's backlog, the company says it is cumulatively oversold through 2026 and with bookings extended to the end of the decade, saying, put simply, if they don't book any more deals by the end of the year, they would still be sold out two years forward through 2025 and 2026. This is a look at their last, latest quarterly results. You can see revenue a little shy of expectations, but earnings per share beating expectations. Right now, we're seeing a pop in pre-market up more than 6%, guys. 
All right, Inez, thanks so much here. You mentioned the pre-market trading here, some of the action that we're seeing play out before the bell. We're just about one minute until that opening bell. So let's see where futures stand right now. Looks like major averages taking a bit of a breather here. Stocks taking a bit of a breather in terms of the S&P and NASDAQ at least looks like it's going to open just to the upside. You're seeing some activity here in the bond market this morning. Investors really digesting the latest round of econ data that we got out this morning. The latest rating on GDP slipping just a bit, despite the fact that at least overall consumers out there continuing to spend, but being a little bit more discerning in terms of how they are spending, what they are spending on. And then when you talk about that FOMO rally and where we are at those current levels, you got to take a look at Bitcoin and the move that we are seeing here uh, leading up to the opening bell on Wall Street. But Bitcoin obviously continuing to trade up above 60,000 as that crypto rally extends to the fifth day. So let's take a look at the opening bell. You've got Goldman Sachs ringing the bell from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. You also got the excitement playing out from the NASDAQ here, Brad. And I think a lot of the questions, the focal point of investors is going to be mostly really some of that activity being held until we get that latest uh, reading on inflation tomorrow, the Fed's preferred uh, inflation gauge with PCE. Yeah, I got a lot of fist pumps on the screen right mm -hmm. now from both the NASDAQ and the NYSE as today's trading session, this hump day trading session begins. And we are continuing to track the Dow, the S&P 500, and the NASDAQ at the open. It looks like we opened down across the board. Let's get to Jared Blickery, who's standing by with more and the Wi-Fi Interactive on the big screen out there, Jared. Oh, the big screen, and you can see it's a, it's a red morning here, and all 11 sectors in the S&P 500, the large cap index, are underwater. Worst off is communication services, down about 59 basis points in the corner. Uh, after that, real estate, health care, materials, but we're not looking at any losses uh, more than 1% uh, down. And let's just take a quick look at the NASDAQ, and then I'm going to get to the small caps. But real quickly here, we have a lot more red than green. We do have some of the uh, mega magnificent seven here, Microsoft in the green for one third of one percent. Apple just barely holding on to some water, onto some gains there, and Tesla up about forty uh, basis points. But I want to check in on the ten-year T-note yield. It has been coiling. You could say it's uh, coiling for a move. We don't know if it's going to be to the upside or the downside. But if it goes to the upside, uh, could be a headwind for stocks. But uh, we don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. We are not there just yet. Another thing I'm tracking is the U.S. dollar. This is a three-month chart of the U.S. dollar index, and it is just breaking this negative trend line to the upside. This also has potentially negative uh, implications for the market. But then overall, small, small caps have really been ripping, and that's thanks to uh, what we've seen in the biotech space, and a couple of the uh, names really driving things. Let me just pull up one of the smaller players, hard to see, uh, but Vertex Pharmaceutical, uh, Viking Therapeutics, excuse me, up 132% over the last two days. Over the last three years, you can see up over 1,200%, guys. All right, Jared, thanks so much for breaking the moves that we're seeing in some of those stocks play out today. The FOMO trade, going back to what, where we started yeah. the show with Josh, just in terms of the dramatic move to the upside that we've seen in a handful of names. All right, we'll keep right here on Yahoo Finance. Much more of your market action ahead. We'll be right back.
All right, well, stocks under some pressure at the start of the trading day. Investors here looking ahead to comments that we will be getting from Fed officials later today and also tomorrow's read on inflation that PCE print could potentially move the market, can be a catalyst or could really put equities under pressure. So let's talk about where valuations are today and what that tells us about the trading activity that's likely ahead for the markets. We want to bring in Scott Cronard. He is the city's U.S. equity strategist and managing director. Scott, it's good to see you here. So the debate that most people are having on the street right now is it all comes down to the valuations of just a handful of names. S&P valuations is really front and center of that conversation. What do you think the setup looks like for the S&P at this point? So, you know, so we've been using a 5,100 year-end target, Shauna, for, you know, some time now. And, and so we're approaching that level. The way we're characterizing this is that Obviously, we've had a very strong move in the broader market. It's it's led by several of the the big or mega the big seven or mag seven, however you'd like to uh, phrase that. Uh, but we do think there's been broadening under the surface. You've had a pretty strong rally in many other sectors and stocks um, off of that November low, with a number of companies hitting 52-week highs up to levels we haven't seen since 2021. Now, what's been happening here in the case of the big seven? you definitely have seen an earnings tailwind that's supporting the move in, in, in that action. For the broader market though, that other 493, you're seeing better price action, but we're still looking for that underlying earnings inflection. The result is that the market, whether the big seven or the other 493, are trading at valuations that are in sort of the top 10, uh, de uh, the top 10% of its last 20 year history. Bottom line, uh, we're fairly constructive on the earnings outlook from here, um, but we think we're at a point where we need to buy some time for the fundamentals to grow into said valuations. Scott, we were trying to remember in our morning meeting, was it was it your team that came up with MAG7? And, and how much longer does this kind of Magnificent 7 trade kind of still have legs or do we need to reframe it? Do we need to retitle it? Yeah, I can't take credit for Mag7. We've been using Big7 for a while as ah. our alternative. But but what I would say, we've been arguing for some time now that um, that 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 cohort would become more idiosyncratic. They'll begin trading off of their own company specific fundamentals and less so as a as a group of of, of seven names. You're seeing that in the year to date performance, and we've tried to play that via our. Uh, industry group and sector weights. As an example, we're underweight autos, but we're overweight retail. We're trying to capture you know, components within that on a more company-specific basis. Scott, when you take a look at the euphoria maybe that's playing out in the market right now, and I want to bring up the Levkovich Index and, and what we are seeing from that, as you guys have pointed out here in recent notes. And when we pull that up on the screen, you can see we are right below that euphoria level. When we talk about the upside maybe that we still have to go here for the S&P, do you see that index crossing above that euphoria level soon? And how much fluctuation do you typically see on a weekly or monthly basis within this? Yeah, so the Levkovich index, it will tend to lag. It has some elements mm -hmm. in it that will lag by uh, a couple of weeks or if not a month. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see it mechanically move into more of a euphoria uh, 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 position here. You know, I think the way we're thinking about it is that, yes, that's a sentiment indicator. We have to be attentive to that. Typically, what you need is some, let's call it fundamental or macro prod to, to cause the sentiment to shift. That's the, the tricky place right now. We think we're in a very strong fundamental position in aggregate for the S&P 500. Again, we just keep coming back to this point that our, our fair value work suggests the S&P is a little bit stretched. As you go to heightened uh, sentiment reasons, you just have to be a little bit circumspect, circumspect here and allow for, um, you know, sort of, you know, the market to digest some of these gains as fundamentals catch up with the, uh, the price action. Scott, thanks so much for taking the time here this morning. Scott Croner, City U.S. Equity Strategist and Managing Director. We appreciate the time. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Coming up, is the Magnificent Seven era dead? Our next guest thinks it might be. For more on this, stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
The Magnificent Seven has driven 50% of the S&P 500 gains so far this year. That's according to Yahoo Finance's calculation. Our next guest, who's actually one of the first on Wall Street to coin the term Magnificent Seven, well, he's warning that the group's remarkable run is over. So let's bring him in. Mike O'Rourke, a Jones Trading Chief of Market Strategist, is here. Mike, it's great to have you. So there's so much excitement surrounding the Magnificent Seven, obviously still being led by NVIDIA, but the group as a whole why are you warning that maybe the best days are behind it? Well, I think the key factor here is this earnings season that we just had. Um, the peak week for earning, the earnings season was the, you know, the beginning of February, February 1st. And um, I think Apple reported that day. I believe Meta reported that day. And, um, you know, we just had the video kind of wrap up the MAG-7 names last week. And what we saw was the biggest market cap gain in one day was Meta when it reported. And then that was obviously shattered by NVIDIA last week when it added $277 billion in market cap. And I think those prospects for those two names are so drastically different and their valuations are more attractive than the rest of the group that I think you're going to see investors differentiate between those leadership names and favor ones over, you know, over the others. And I, you're not going to have this rising tide where these seven names lift the entire market higher or the S&P 500 higher for that matter. Um, and I think that that's going to be the difference going forward. It's going to make for tougher returns. If we did see a wave of profit taking among the Magnificent Seven and, and people holding on to that, investors holding on to that, what type of correction do you believe that that would also trigger within some of the broader market? Well, that's the interesting thing. As that group rallied sharply last year, the other 493 became less expensive. Mm -hmm. um, so. So that, you know, it would be nice to see rotation out into the balance of the market. And I'm not sure that I'm not sure that they're, you know, the Magnificent Seven are going to create a market wide correction. I just think like investors are looking at the market today and they're sitting there saying, OK, Meta had problems a couple of years ago. They seem to have sorted them out. It trades less than 25 times earnings is growing quickly. NVIDIA is obviously growing very quickly. Their revenues are supposed to grow 70 percent this year. And they're making the comparison to an Apple where revenues are supposed to grow one and a half percent this year, or a Tesla where they're supposed to grow 15 percent, but we know the EV space is experiencing a lot of challenges. So I think you're going to see rotation within the group, and I think you're going to see people venture out to other places in the market. Obviously, one place they've already started looking is the GLP-1 um, diet drug names like Lilly and Novo, um, where Lilly is now bigger than Tesla and market cap. So I think that's what we're looking at here is more of a churn. Um, yeah, I think it's going to prevent the market from having widespread gains, but I think people will be looking for different investment opportunities. Mike, what do you think the upside then looks like for some of those GLP-1 names? Uh, I, you know, I'm not a drug analyst, but uh, the, it, it's clear that they are disrupting numerous industries, right? Yeah. They're disrupting, obviously, the packaged fl foods industry. They're disrupting the medical device industry. So uh, they're disrupting the healthcare industry, for, like uh, hospitals and, and um managed care providers if we're going to have healthier individuals or, you know, if people living a healthier lifestyle. So there, there is a lot of interesting aspects to that trade. Um, I just don't, you know, I don't look at the spot, stock specifically, but I know that obviously they're performing very well. Are there other winners, especially when you think about the broader theme that has propelled the Magnificent Seven? It's been around generative AI, and it's been on some of the large cash shorts that those companies as well, they sit on top of in order to deploy some of the most advanced or quickly deploy solutions into the market that allow them to capitalize on that generative AI trade. So what is the next part of the generative AI trade from your purview that could really catch hold? Well it's, it's, well, it's just really interesting. I think what we're seeing among these names is the digestion of the moves they've had, right? You're looking at a Microsoft that added a trillion dollars of micro, uh, market capitalization after making its, you know, its, its biggest investment in open AI early last year. But then you're hearing reports that the, you know, users of the early functionality are think, thinking it's overpriced or not money, worth the money they're paying for. Hmm. Obviously, you have Google and its Gemini debacle last week that it, it's still licking its wounds on. So I think that's the next phase to see, OK, we know it's an important technology. We know it should be a game changing technology. But there's obviously some kinks that need to be worked out. And in the meantime, 
we've added trillions of dollars in market cap. Again, it just makes more for the argument for consolidation in the space. Mike, I'm curious from a strategy standpoint, how closely are you factoring in the Fed's timing of that first rate cut? And is too much being, I guess, discussed about the, the actual timing versus the number of cuts and the extent of those cuts between now and year end? Well, it's interesting. Obviously, the market was very excited for rate cuts. Um, from my perspective, where I say, it, I, you know, I don't know why, because we've had a very strong economy. We have an unemployment rate near six decade lows. We have inflation that's still running very hot. Um, I know the month, you know, the monthly, the three month, hour, you know, annualized inflation rate is closer to two percent. But again, we're still seeing a very hot economy. Obviously. GDP revised this morning down by 10 basis points to 3.2%. Uh, that followed a 4.9% GDP print, and this quarter's tracking 3.25%. So I don't think the rate cuts are appropriate you know, at this moment. And I think that's going to be an interesting story later in this year, because you had a lot of companies refinance debt during the pandemic at very low interest rates. As those maturities start to come due and they have to roll that debt with the Fed funds rate above 5%, it gets a little more challenging. But the market has been extremely optimistic on rates for the past several years. It didn't think the Fed was going to raise as high as they did. It thinks they're going to cut more so than they will. Um, but right now, the policy is appropriate, and the Fed should be, you know, pu pushing, you know, you know, pushing the pause bucket, but, button on market expectations about rate cuts because they're just not warranted at this point in time. Mike O'Rourke, Jones Trading Chief Market Strategist. Mike, thanks so much for taking the time here today. Appreciate it. All your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Shares of United Health under pressure this morning after the U.S. Department of Justice reportedly kicks off an antitrust investigation into the company's relationship between its insurance unit and health services arm, according to the Wall Street Journal. For more on this, we've got Yahoo Finance's Anjali Kemlani here with us with more. Hey, Anjali. That's right, guys. Hey, yeah, this report not surprising a lot of people who have either, you know, looked at United's uh, strategy before or those who are former employees. We've actually spoken to some of those folks ourselves here at Yahoo finance and I'll say that um, you know some of the things listed in this report including what the relationship is between the two sides and whether or not uh, the company is inflating costs and inflating claims from one side to the other uh, really touches on some points of concern that others have had over the years especially as Optum has grown to be the largest or one of the largest employers of physicians so really setting up the company for a hard look and it is not a very good year for United if you take a look back in the past year not only did they recently have that cyber attack on their change healthcare subsidiary, but they also uh, are facing a class action lawsuit for denying claims through AI for elderly uh, Medicare Advantage uh, members. So it really has been a tough year for the company when it comes to a lot of the different moving parts of it. And it's interesting that this is the thing that has really hit the stock. Uh, but what, what the results of that probe will be, of course, we will have to see. Uh, but I've heard over the past several months that basically what has happened is, uh, you know, there has been looking like inflation of the business that Optum has done over time, making it look like a really strong growth company when really it was just one side of the company funneling to another. So will be interesting to see if those claims pan out. And it's a story we are going to continue to track again. United Health under pressure off just nearly 4% here. But on just another huge story that's playing out within your sector right now. We've talked so much about GLP-1s and the weight loss drugs. New developments out from Viking Therapeutics, which could really potentially disrupt this sector even more could disrupt and Viking could even become a target for acquisition. That's really what is being set up here. Uh, they did come out yesterday with their phase two uh, top line results showing a stronger efficacy in weight loss than competitors Lilly and Novo Nordisk. And so that really, of course, it's just a mid-stage trial that's really important to point out. So what they will have to do now is prove that this up to 15% of body weight loss is replicable in a larger population in the phase three trials. Uh, what's interesting to point out though is it's similar uh, with the others in the sense that it's a weekly dose and the side effects are also comparable. They lost about a fifth of the participating uh, trial members because of the nausea and the other side effects. So it will be interesting to see what the actual phase three results are. But right now, looking strong, everyone's really excited about it. And this is not, uh, uh, you know, unsimilar to what we have talked about on the show of what is expected down the pike with this GLP-1s. Now it's a two company gain, uh, but it is one of those things that it, it could still be uh, a lot of competition coming down the pike. There's at least 50 other candidates. But it really sets up uh, something interesting for Lily, which is I heard your last guest mm. talk about, you know, the strength of the company. And this is not necessarily a threat to the company itself because it has such a large market cap. It is one of the two, ironically talking about United Health, uh, one of the two companies that many experts have told me could be one of the first a trillion dollar healthcare company. So even with this competition, it's not really looking like oh, too much of a hit for the company. At least for now, right? Anj, thanks so much for putting that in perspective here for us. All right, we'll keep it right here on Yahoo Finance. Much more of your market action ahead. We'll be right back.
Good morning. Welcome back to Yahoo Finance. It's 10 a.m. here Eastern Time. Brad Smith alongside Shauna Smith. We're about 30 minutes into the trading day. Let's take a look at how things are shaping up right now. Stocks lower this morning as investors, they're holding their breath for the Fed's favorite inflation gauge. That's out Thursday, PCE. We're going to be watching that closely. Meanwhile, here, though, Bitcoin taking center stage as it surges past $60,000, now up above $61,000. So getting closer to all-time high territory here. Let's take a look at some of those individual trending tickers here. First up, advanced auto parts rising, upbeat profit guidance, offsetting mixed quarterly results. Now, the auto parts retailer delivered a mixed picture in its fourth quarter, reporting a wider than expected adjusted loss per share, but it did meet the street's estimates on sales. CEO expressing some disappointment with the company's 2023 performance, saying that he feels, quote, a sense of urgency to stabilize the business. Meanwhile, shares of clothing company Contour Brands sinking as its fourth quarter results fall short of analyst expectations. The maker of Wrangler and Lee Jeans saw revenue fall in Q4, driven by a drop in its wholesale segment, which saw retailers keeping inventory tight amid slowing consumer spending. And Bumble shares are also in the red, off just about 7.5%. The company reported a downbeat revenue forecast. It also announced some cost-cutting measure, measures in an effort here to right-size the business. Now, it is cutting 30% of the workforce, 30%. These layoffs are one of the first major moves from the dating app's new CEO, who pointed to a need for Bumble to innovate in order to attract more paying users. Again, the stock off just about 8%. Well, shares of glasses and contact lens retailer Warby Parker falling today. The company beat expectations for revenue in its fourth quarter, reported a narrower loss compared to a year ago. But what the street is bumping up against is those gross margins shrinking in the latest quarter. Joining us now on this, we've got the Warby Parker co-founders and co-CEOs, Neil Blumenthal and Dave Gilbala. Great to see you both here. And thanks for joining us to help break down some of what you saw in the quarter and the outlook going forward on the margins. The street hang up clearly on there, what do you believe is going to be part of the formula to really kind of beat on some of the expectations that the street has for where Warby Parker can perform? Yeah, I think we saw a run up in our share price going into earnings. So we see some um, uh, sort of return to, to where we were a, a few weeks ago happening today, perhaps. Um, but we're excited about this year. We're seeing really strong momentum in the business. We're seeing an acceleration in growth, as our 2024 guidance suggests. Um, and uh, we're seeing stabilization in our gross margins. You know, one of the things that we've been doing is investing in eye exams and, and contact lenses. Um, and these are sort of great strategic initiatives for us as we pursue holistic vision care and it uh, expands the lifetime value of our customers, uh, expands the contribution margin of those those customers. And last year we made significant investments there um, and that had an impact on, on gross margin. But as we look to 2024 and beyond, um, we see uh, increased progressive penetration, which is our highest gross margin glasses product um, that will stabilize uh, gross margins and hopefully expand them in, in years to come. Dave, taking a step back here and going off of what Neil was just saying, some of the trends or focus areas within your business for the years ahead, what are you seeing, though, today from the consumer? Are as many customers coming into your store? What does foot traffic look like? And then how is that being factored in or, I guess, really impacting sales here? Yeah, we're coming off an unusual period over the last couple of years. Um, uh, resulting from kind of some hangover effects from from the pandemic, uh, but we're encouraged by uh, a lot of the consumer demand signals that we're seeing, um, and that's true. Uh, kind of what we saw at the end of the the quarter around holiday and FSA uh, shopping season, um, and what we've seen uh, year to date in in 2024. And so uh, we're uh, excited uh, about this year. Um, we're not uh, kind of seeing a flood of pent up demand um, from lower activity over the last couple of years, but we are seeing kind of more stability and, uh, and some positive signals uh, from our, our consumers. There's no question that um, you know, overall there are continue to be some uh, uh, macro factors that are impacting where people are, are spending their dollars. Uh, inflation over the last couple of years and now higher interest rates um, mean that people are looking for their dollars to go further and uh, we've always uh, delivered great value and, and offered 
um, our products and services at a fraction of the price of um, of, of where people are, are used to, to buying glasses and, and getting exams and, and, and contacts. And so um, we feel like we're uh, benefiting disproportionately um, as, as more demand comes back into our category. What have you noticed in the price to produce the glasses and, and the, the lens wear particularly, especially as you do have, it seems like a healthy mix of customers that, you know, still want their traditional frames, but also want the contact lens option. Yeah, contacts has been a, a growing business for us. Um, you know, we kind of, in some respects, built this business backwards. Um, we started selling $95 prescription glasses online in a category where almost nobody was selling online before, right? Typically, um, you go to an optical shop, you get an eye exam, you get glasses and get your contacts there as well. Um, so opening up stores, um, right? We that was relatively new for us five years ago. Now we have, um, you know, uh, a large and highly productive fleet. Our stores um, pay back in 20 months, have uh, target 35% four wall margins. Um, and contact lenses is, is new for us in the last couple of years. And you see that continue to grow. We haven't seen major changes in customer behavior um, in the U.S. between sort of wearing glasses or contacts. Um, and it's a growing category. Category, uh, sixty-six billion billion dollars. So it's a large market um, in which we're still have very small uh, share that we're very excited about. Yeah, I'm curious, and not to dive too much into the stock price, but as CEO, how are you looking at the pressure that your stock has been under now uh, since going public, and in terms of communicating that momentum story or turnaround story here to shareholders? I guess how quickly do you see that taking hold? Yeah, of course. Um, you know, we care uh, about our shareholders and and want to deliver great returns over time. Um, we are coming uh, again off a very unusual period uh, for our category that normally has grown at a very steady pace, regardless of the the economic cycle. Um, and uh, the pandemic really disrupted uh, regular consumer behavior in the category when people have gotten exams, when people have bought glasses, and um, we believe that we're uh, emerging out of that period and should see kind of stability and some of that demand uh, uh, flow through the system. And we feel like we're well positioned to take advantage of that. Um, and so the uh, really the, the best thing we can do uh, to deliver great shareholder returns over time is by focusing on our customers, continue to uh, invest in delivering products and services that um, that are better than uh, customers can can find elsewhere. And, and, and we believe we're doing that. Um, and we anticipate uh, that we'll see uh, a, a accelerating uh, financial returns um, through this year, uh, and that will uh, be reflected in, in our stock price over time. Just the brick and mortar part of the business for a hot second while we have you. I mean, uh, operating brick and mortar, especially in this environment with some of the headwinds, whether that be on the cost for labor, the cost for real estate and, and leases there specifically, you've got that up to 237 stores as of the end of the year. Where do you either see further advancement in penetrating specific markets where it seems like you already have a lot of inroads with consumers and, and customers of Warby Parker and an opportunity to expand that, or even the sunsetting of certain underperforming stores? And when we look across the, our fleet, we see strength. Um, and you're going to see us open 40 new stores this year. There's over 45,000 optical shops uh, in, in the U.S., so we have a long way to go. We commissioned a third-party stuff study that showed that we could have over 900 stores at the productivity levels that we currently have. So for example, paybacks in 20 months and, and four wall margins of 35%. Um, so we see, continue to see a lot of productivity in our stores. Now, um, our ramp um, really started um, in sort of urban centers with street locations. So you'll see us, um, our mix shift a little more suburban as a lot of our newer stores are disproportionately in, in suburban areas. Um, we have seen um, uh, a slight um, difference in performance between suburban versus urban sort of coming out of the, the pandemic, um, but we expect that to narrow. But irrespective, we're investing uh, more in, in, in suburban areas uh, at the moment. Um, and our new stores all have exam capabilities. And we find that when somebody um, gets an eye exam with us, gets glasses and contacts with us, um, they actually spend 2.4x uh, um, what they uh, spend those that 
are just glasses only customers with us. So our push into holistic vision care leads to happier, uh, more valuable customers. I know I said just lastly in my previous question, I lied, I'm sorry. I, I gotta ask you about artificial intelligence and here's why, because you guys have been kind of ahead of this, both in the the on smartphone or on handset experience and how you're leveraging that. And, and that dates back to you know even 2019 and prior to that as well. We've heard a lot of companies try to really latch on to that latest artificial intelligence wave here. But is there a cap on how much investors, how much people should really expect for artificial intelligence to deliver such a delta to businesses, especially based on what you've already seen so far? Yeah, so um, as you mentioned, we've been investing in machine learning and, and AI over the last few years and have rolled out uh, many tools to our customers already that uh, that uh, leverage advances in AI from our virtual vision test that enables people to renew a prescription from home um, in less than 10 minutes uh, to our virtual try-on that um, shows you uh, exactly what you'd look like in any of our frames um, uh, in, a, in a digital manner on your phone or um, on a computer. Um, and so we're uh, excited to continue uh, to invest there. Uh, we have uh, an incredibly strong uh, engineering and, and, and tech team, and um, and that is a differentiator versus um, kind of other other companies in our category. Uh, but uh, ultimately, what customers care about is um, uh, great products and, and convenient services. We we think that AI um, can play a role in uh, driving efficiency and, and creating those really great uh, customer experiences. Um, uh, but uh, the uh, the kind of the the fundamentals of our business uh, will will remain the same, and and we think we can um, uh, add uh, you know incremental uh, some incremental sales and some incremental efficiency, um, but uh, that that's really kind of reflected in in the guidance that that we put out this uh, earlier this morning. All right, Dave Gilboa and Neil Blumenthal, co-founders and co-CEOs of Warby Parker. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us this morning. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Let's get to a big deal that's grabbing our attention here at Yahoo Finance. Disney announcing that it is merging its India TV and streaming business with the country's top conglomerate, Reliance Industries. Now this deal will create an $8.5 billion entertainment giant with Reliance and its affiliates holding more than a 60% stake, Disney holding about a 37% stake within this new joint venture. And Brad, we bring this up because we know India, Disney's India business has really been a focal point for Iger as he does work to streamline Disney, Disney's business really across the globe. But this venture in particular, the reason why Bob Iger is saying that this makes the most sense for Disney up until this point, or at, at this point at least, is that Reliance has a deep understanding of the Indian market and the consumer. It's also going to allow the company to better serve its consumers. 120 TV channels, two streaming platforms, and again, this merger valued around eight and a half billion. Yeah, and it just comes back to the growth of media consumption as well that's targeted within the region. And there have been specific efforts that Disney, a lot of the other streamers have been trying to chart forth, whether that's annexed to sports within the region, and some of those efforts date back to even 2017, 2018, uh, where you saw a lot of focus on trying to scoop up different cricket league sponsorships or cricket league streaming and broadcast rights as well, um, all the way into the content that is either unscripted or, or even scripted content series as well. So uh, this, no doubt, a major move forward in the strategy that we've seen Disney become even more vocal about on the streaming front here. This has a sports element within it. We mentioned um, how this is essentially going to bring together some of the iconic media assets across entertainment, colors, Star Plus, Star Gold, uh, and then sports, Star Sports, Sports 18 as well here. And then you've got Geo Cinema and Hot Star as well. So over 70, 750 million viewers across India uh, is what this is going to cater towards is what these companies are saying within this uh, strategic joint venture as well. All right, we'll keep right here on Yahoo Finance. Much more of your market action ahead. We'll be right back.
We're coming up on the Friday midnight deadline for Congress to avert a partial government shutdown. The New York Times reporting House Speaker Mike Johnson is suggesting another short-term spending bill that would kick the can down the road, so to speak, extending funding for some government agencies through March 8th, but the rest through March 22nd. This comes after top congressional leaders met with President Biden last night. But with no firm deal yet, investors have some concerns about how any shutdown could impact markets. Let's bring in Ed Mills, who's the Raymond James Washington policy analyst, to discuss more. Ed, great to see you here this morning. So help us break this down. I mean, what's the reality that we would see a government shutdown in an era where we still have, and in a time period specifically, where we have Super Tuesday coming up, there's massive political implications if there's nothing that gets done? Yeah, Brad, you highlight that we have a lot going on here in Washington, D.C. So we have that March 1st deadline, Super Tuesdays next uh, week. We have the State of the Union on March 7th. March 8th, we get a, the second deadline here. Um, so my advice would be cut a deal. Figure out we're well into FY24. That started on October 1st. We had a deal on how much we're supposed to spend, um, kicking the can down the road. Um, we're getting closer each time, but we're not yet close enough. Could we have a shutdown? Sure. My job at Raymond James is trying to figuring out how that impacts the market. And what I would tell your viewers is that when we looked at every shutdown since the 90s, on average, the market has been up 3.2% during shutdowns. So they get a lot of noise. They're really important in D.C. They're really important for the employees at those agencies but the market either shrugs it off or actually surges during that time period. Ed, the market might shrug it off. It might not be an immediate concern, maybe in terms of the, how that's reflected within the market, but say a deal is not reached. In terms of the blame, if the GOP shoulders the blame, and that is then obviously could potentially be a threat here to the general election coming up uh, later this year, what does that mean for policy and how should investors be thinking about that aspect? So, Shana, I, I do think that when we look at previous shutdowns, um, almost exclusively Republicans have gotten the blame because we've seen them being the leaders of saying there needs to be certain policies that go in or certain cuts to the budget before they're willing to support it. Uh, once you shut down the government, uh, almost no policy is de developed. And so um, the only thing you do is reopen the government. If we are in a world where Republicans are being backed into the wall and being forced to reopen, I think that has actually pressure that builds to also do uh, the defense supplemental that passed the Senate overwhelmingly, a vote of 70 to 29. And so this is a, a binary event in some ways for defense stocks. If you don't have a defense bill and we could get the automatic cuts in a couple of months, which would be almost a double digit defense cut, or in the flip side, we would see a defense supplemental pass, um, significant impact there. As we look forward on the election, uh, Republicans uh, under Speaker McCarthy wanted to show that House Republicans could govern, especially with this narrow majority. This dysfunction and in, in the how much of Speaker Johnson's job is on the line adds to a narrative that they are not able to govern with this small majority, which on the margin gives Democrats, at least in the race for the House of Representatives, a slight margin come November. Ed, as we're trying to kind of give investors the best playbook going into this general election season, of course, Super Tuesday, as we mentioned a moment ago, what are the key things that investors should be watching for on Super Tuesday to really set up for the general election and, and what's to be expected there? What some of the primary issues that we could hear both candidates really pound the pavement on and how that could impact portfolio strategy as well? Yeah, Brad, so the playbook that we have historically had uh, for election years, uh, first and foremost on presidential election years, they're the second best year for the market in the four-year presidential term. But what we've seen previously is the market weak um, until there was a nominee. Usually that, that was weakness between January to March, which was Super Tuesday. One of the things that we have said this year is that the nominees seem to be a little bit more of a foregone conclusion as we started out this year. So we didn't necessarily have to wait until March to get that conclusion. What we're watching on Super Tuesday is how does Nikki Haley fare? Uh, after Super Tuesday, Republicans uh, go almost exclusively to a winner take all. So unless she's able to get to 50% in some of these states, 
she is going to get zero delegates unless um, something happens with the Trump campaign. So if she's moving to the sideline, is she just dropping out? Or would she be trying to get encouraged to do a third party run? No labels does not have a candidate. They wanted to announce this after Super Tuesday. And so we're going to see a lot of polling. How does she match up against a three way race between Trump in Biden, because no labels has not been able to get that candidate with high quality other candidates saying they're not going to run uh, for president. So look for that as the boomlet. And that would be really interesting for the markets, because there's a big difference between a Nikki Haley presidency, a Donald Trump presidency and a Joe Biden presidency. And Mills, always great uh, to get your insight here, especially ahead of Super Tuesday. Raymond James, Washington policy analyst. Thanks so much, Ed. Thank you. The Federal Trade Commission and a coalition of attorneys general are suing to block Kroger's $25 billion acquisition of Albertsons. Nine states currently scrutinizing the grocery store's mega merger. Now among them is Nevada Attorney General Aaron Ford, who believes that the deal would create an anti-competitive marketplace. We want to bring him in now. Aaron Ford, he is Nevada's attorney general. Attorney general, thanks so much for taking the time uh, to speak with us here this morning. Clearly, you're looking to challenge this suit. I'm curious as to why you don't support this deal. Why do you see this as a risk here to consumers? Well, first off, thanks so much for having me on to have this important conversation. Uh, but to your question, this is an example of where there was a major confluence between the data that we analyzed, the legal research that we did, and the community input that we received. Uh, and it all aligned and led us to the conclusion that opposing this merger was going to be appropriate for a number of reasons. Uh, listening to our constituents, we learned um, through my Bureau of Consumer Protection, through the dozens of community um, engagement uh, sessions that we had with Chair Khan, actually from the FTC, actually visiting three of those with me, we learned that, about concerns about higher prices for groceries, um, uh, concerns about stores that would be closing, and, and concerns about employee wages and benefits. And uh, again, those were... Um, uh, repeated through the data that we did and the legal uh, analysis that we did that determined that, in fact, there were big concerns around competition in those areas. And so that's largely the reason why we've decided to join this bipartisan coalition to oppose this merger. Attorney General, there, ha there has been pushback, obviously, from the, the two parties that are involved, but even more broadly speaking, from industry experts or former FTC members that are saying that, hey, when you look at the competition from Walmart, you look at the competition from Amazon, the fact that you have two giants within this space, that if this deal is not approved, it's going to give them even more power. I'm curious how, then, you see that as being okay or maybe not having as big of an issue with it when you compare that to what could play out with more pricing uh, competition. Well, it's the latter part that you just mentioned that gave rise to this lawsuit. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, we think that the competition that currently exists between Kroger and Albertsons uh, in terms of groceries, for example, uh, in terms of the pharmacy services, uh, for example, and in terms of the labor market, uh, those far outweigh uh, the, the countervailing issues that were raised by the parties who are seeking to enter into this merger. Uh, we've seen price competition uh, as a good thing as between Kroger and Albertsons. Uh, that will go away in a merger. We've seen the promotion of pricing discounts. Uh, we've seen uh, product quality competition between these two entities. Uh, uh, and uh, again, that will all go away, as would the store condition competition and customer service competition. And that's just in the grocery context. We're not even touching on you know, the pharmacy context uh, uh, in the labor market. And so you know, we see those, again, as, as very real issues that we have to uh, um, stand up against and try to protect our, uh, our relevant constituencies from. If this deal was to go through, is it is it clear from your assessment what type of food desert uh, situation this would also add on to or layer on to, uh, not just within Nevada, but within uh, a lot of regions within the country? Well, let me actually back up just for a second and want to, you know, suggest that you two, uh, when you come to our state, I don't want you to get price, uh, you know, upcharged. You have to say Nevada. Our state Nevada, is Nevada. Nevada. You're, look, I made the... If you get upcharged, you can't call me. That's not price gouging. I you, thought about that upcharged. right after I said it, too. Look, last time I was in Las Vegas, they let it slide because there's a lot of other things they let slide in that's Las right, Vegas. Right. My, my apologies. But, but, but to, to your point, uh, that's a very great question, and that's a very real issue. Food deserts are already prevalent in our um, um, state here. Uh, and in fact, I went out to a rural area called Pahrump and uh, was advised, and I'm glad we went out there and talked to the constituents there because they, they reminded us that 
they're rural, but we have Frontier Nevada as well that drives to rural areas 100 miles every month or so to do their shopping. And if one of those stores is affected, then that those those Frontier areas are likewise affected. And so certainly food deserts is a concern that also um, peaked its head uh, and piqued my interest um, and um, supported my decision here to join this litigation. I'm curious, uh, Attorney General, beyond, and you mentioned the conversations that you're having with uh, Nevadans within your state, what are you hearing just in terms of how much pressure they are still under, given the fact that inflation remains uh, well above that 2% target that we have for the Fed? And, and how optimistic are they at all optimistic about some of the progress that has been made uh, in the Fed's fight against inflation? Well, I think I have two answers to that. The yeah. first, I'm going to take the latter one first. I mean, they they are happy, obviously, that that, that we're seeing some fluctuations and in some and, and in some areas a decrease in, in pricing that um, makes it more affordable for some homes. But as a general matter, um, people are quite disturbed with the, the pricing of, of groceries, right? Uh, and, and again, that speaks specifically and directly to the comp the competition that Kroger and Albertsons currently have. And, and if they merge. Um, the concern is that those prices will continue to go up. And we I have heard from so many constituents. We we met with, again, in person, at least a dozen meetings. But we got, had over a thousand online uh, responses to our survey, uh, which obviously are confidential. But uh, the, the, the crux of those were exactly the same. People were concerned about the pricing of groceries uh, and, and um, overwhelmingly opposed to what we're, what, what's being proposed here. What, what was the largest finding from that survey? You mentioned it's con confidential, but I, I wonder if there's one thing that could really steer the decision making, both from the FTC as well as from the team of attorney generals that have essentially come together to really spotlight this deal and, and at least give some direct feedback that results in looking or taking a second look at this tie up. Yeah, listen, I think uh, it's fair to say that the concerns we received in those surveys echoed what we had already heard in the in, in the open sessions uh, and what is already detailed in our redacted complaint. Concerns about the highest, the higher prices for groceries, concerns about stores that were closed, labor concerns, concerns about wages and benefits. Uh, some of these places have pharmacies in them and, and uh, the, the problem that could be caused if these stores merge uh, and certain uh, opportunities to get prescriptions refilled uh, would, 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 would go away. Um, some even, even have gas stations at them. And so we heard a few concerns about what would happen in that regard. Um, uh, and so uh, th those, those were, again, um, concerns that were echoed in other aspects of our investigation. Um, and, and that's, you know, th again, that gives us great concern. Attorney General for the Battleborn State. I, I dare I get Nevada wrong again. Aaron Ford, thanks so much for taking the time here today. Happy to be here. Thank Blame you. Blame the Philly accents. I know. It's, for it's both of us. Jesus. Pennsylvania <laughs> gets me again every time, Aaron. Thanks so much. <laughs> thanks, everybody. Talk soon. Guys, coming up, Lemonade shares taking a hit after warning of a near-term profit concern. We'll speak to the CEO next. Focusing on the biggest movers and shakers on Wall Street. This is market domination, and here, every day is game day. We have one hour left until the market close. It's game time for investors to make their final plays. The clock is ticking, and we've got you covered with our quarter by quarter playbook. We're bringing you in on all the market action with step by step analysis of our biggest trending tickers and expert insight into the day's biggest headlines. We'll bring you the closing bell and get you to the finish line. This is Market, Market Domination. Domination. Tune in daily from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern.
Shares of Lemonade plunging this morning after saying 2023 was a year of extraordinary challenges. The insurance company says it's going to focus on growth in the coming year, planning to roughly double its budget, which it warns will hurt profits in the near term. Daniel Schreiber, who is the Lemonade CEO, joins us now in studio to discuss more. Thanks so much for taking some of the time here today. Good to be with you. Absolutely. So let's discuss this because the, the street sending shares lower and perhaps just on the announcements that you made around some of these spending plans here to really grow out the business. So what are you going to kind of track up against? What's the barometer to say whether or not some of that spending is working for the company? Absolutely. So we're coming off of perhaps our best quarter ever. You know, revenue up by a third, gross profit up threefold, um, our losses, EBITDA losses halving. So we're really seeing dramatic progress. Um, in terms of our guidance, we did say because of that, we're going to spend more on growth. This is a great opportunity to start growing. We've been growing at an increasing rate. Mm -hmm. So we were at 18% a couple of quarters ago, 20 will be 21 now and continuously grow because we do see opportunities for increasing the long-term profitability of the business. And insurance is such a huge, vast market that spending now at a roughly CAC to LTV ratio of three to one, mm -hmm. every dollar you spend comes back threefold. But it does mean that we're going to slightly depress earnings. We're going to continue to improve earnings, don't get me wrong. EBITDA will increase and get better this year relative to last year, but perhaps at a rate that signals that we're investing in our future rather than just taking the profit now. Do you know how, I guess in terms of moving the needle, how big of an impact do you see this having on your bottom line in the longer term? And, and what's more specifically your message to the street? Clearly, they're a little bit worried about the spending that's going to be happening here in the coming quarters. But why do you think that this is a strategy that's going to pay off in the long run? At a fundamental level, all lights are green. We're really seeing everything getting better. A loss ratio collapsed by 12% year on year. Our operating expense shrunk year on year. The efficiencies that our AIs are driving, we've been automated through AIs from the get-go. So we're growing revenue 31% and actually shrinking R&D costs, marketing costs, and operating costs because we're using generative AI and other AIs to do a lot of our work for us. So all of that emboldens us to continue to invest because every dollar that we invest returns itself about threefold over. And if you're long-term oriented, and we absolutely are, that just makes so much sense. So we're going to continue to do that. We have said that next year will be cash flow positive. We have said that the following year we will be EBITDA positive. We reiterated those. But we have to get through that extra growth before we turn those corners entirely. As we continue to get more and more reads on inflation and where inflation continues to show up, insurance is, is one of those areas here. And a lot of consumers perhaps asking why premiums are getting higher, why we're continuing to see that be one of the stickier elements of the services inflation. From your seat at the, at the helm of, of Lemonade and all of the services that come forward, why is it getting more expensive? And, and ultimately, how are you going to look across some of those costs that consumers are still having to pay right now and perhaps bring that down eventually over some time? So notwithstanding the great results that we just announced, insurance as a sector has suffered terribly in the last couple of years, largely because of, because of inflation. Mm. And most businesses can adjust prices when their costs go up. Insurance companies may not. We're heavily regulated. You have to apply to the regulator to allow you to raise prices. By the time that comes through, you've incurred a lot of losses. This has been the worst year for combined ratios in the insurance sector for generations. You're seeing some of the largest insurance companies in the nation pulling out of some of its largest markets, California and other places. So this has been very, very tough. At last, we're seeing inflation come down and rates go up. And that's fabulous news for Lemonade and for our shareholders and for the sector as a whole. It does translate into higher costs, higher prices for our consumers. Um, but it's really just about matching rate to risk. How, how has this also changed where you go about evaluating claims? What's, what's been perhaps the calculus around that as well for customers who come back and say, all right, now I need to tap into what I've been paying for? Absolutely. So, we monitor everything about that at Lemonade. So the net promoter score is not merely when we sell you a policy 90 seconds through a bot. It's about when we pay your claim in three seconds with a bot. And about half of our claims are paid without any human intervention at all. That not only lowers costs, but it, of course, delights consumers. And we're using a lot of technology in order to try and identify fraud and fast track any claim that is legitimate. And as I say, about half of our claims are paid that way. So we're very focused on returning to the consumer the value that they are expecting to get. And I believe Lemonade is without parallel, without 
equal in terms of net promoter score and customer satisfaction levels in the U.S. today. Daniel, going back to what you just said a minute ago, there some of the distress that you have seen play out within the sector. Is the worst or the biggest challenges, safe to say, at least in the short term here, behind you, behind the industry? Is, is it looking much more positive here from here on out? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. One never knows quite what the future holds, but yes, the, the trends are very, very good. As I say, rates are coming online to the chagrin of consumers, but it's necessary for the industry to be able to continue to service its customers. And we are seeing inflation come down. Natural catastrophes and other things are still obviously yeah. loom large and, and pose a threat. And more fundamentally, I think, just the power of technology to automate lower costs and predict with greater precision than humans ever could what kind of risk different people represent and then to match rates and risk um, at a level that's never been able to be done before is incredibly empowering and bodes very, very, very well for the future. You got a generative AI mentioned in this earnings report as well, the Gen AI framework and how that's handling some of the customer emails. I wonder, as you deploy more generative AI or any type of artificial intelligence for the company, how that operationally changes the headcount structure that you have right now. Absolutely, and Lemonade was really built for this moment. You know, we were founded in 2015, and at the time we said we were built on top of AI. Nobody knew quite what that was, but today it's very fashionable to say that we've been doing that from day one. So. For us, this is a, a, these new technologies, newer generations of AI naturally filter into our systems. We were built for this. We've been doing stuff with AI from day one. There's no huge transformation because our platforms were built atop AI from day one. What that means is that we're able to shrink payroll even as we grow our business. Do you plan to shrink payroll we, further? We have. In yeah. 2023, our payroll shrank. That doesn't mean we're letting people go, but as there's natural churn, we don't have to rehire people, even as our business has been growing very, very fast. As I say, growing by a third this year, our actual payroll shrank, our operating expenses shrank, not only in customer-facing places of the business, but even in engineering teams where Copilot and other generative AI technologies are allowing one engineer to do so much more than he or she could do just a year or two ago. So we're really harnessing these technologies, I think, like no other insurance company, certainly in the US. Daniel Schreiber, always great to have you, especially here in studio. Thanks so much for, for joining us, CEO of Lemonade. Thank you both. We'll keep right here on Yahoo Finance. Much more of your market action ahead. We'll be right back.
Despite headwinds from the UAW strike in September and October, shares of automaker Stellantis have rallied more than 40 percent over the past six months, trading just above 26 bucks a share today. One analyst, though, downgrading the stock, calling it fairly valued after that massive run up and then fairly valued at the current level. We want to bring in the analyst behind that call, Daniel Roska. He is the senior analyst at Bernstein. Daniel, it's good to have you here. So we've seen a big run up in the stock despite some of the headwinds and challenges facing Stellantis. You're, you're saying it's currently, uh, it, it's valued, um, fair valued around its current levels here. What do you need to see or what is, are there any catalysts on the horizon that you see potentially really changing the narratives surrounding Stellantis? Yeah, I think the up and down side is, is fairly, um, fairly clear right now, right? 24 is going to be a tough year for all of autos, but especially Stellantis, right? They are seeing very high inventories in the U.S. that will push discounts up. The order books in Europe, their second largest market, are also kind of running out, which will push, push up discounts, and that will take earnings down probably EBIT margins down 240 basis points year on year. The upside clearly is that this is a great company, right? They restructured after merging between Fiat Chrysler and Peugeot, and they really did a good job of setting this up for future success. Looking towards their 2030 targets, 300 billion in revenues, about 7% EPS growth until then. That's not, you know, they don't have to shy away, but right now in this moment, the next couple of months will be dominated kind of by more headwinds the next catalyst will be the Capital Markets Day in June. Um, Mid-June, they have a Capital Markets Day up in Auburn Hills and will lay out the strategy to the end of the decade. And I think that will give investors and probably analysts a little bit more confidence again. You mentioned those dare forward 2030 targets, and, and you even mentioned in your note and just now, ambitious but not unrealistic, especially with that 6.8% revenue compound annual growth rate. How much of you think that strategy is factoring in a major or significant improvement versus the environments that we have right now for car purchases? Well, that's a great question. I think the difficulty always is right now, car makers are earning as much as they ever had. And so there'll be competing factors, right? We will see a market normalization. Consumers can look forward to cheaper cars again. And at the same time, of course, the uh, companies like Celandis will not stand still, right? They will work on the costs, they will bring down costs on the platforms, they will introduce software-driven revenues. So I think it's a give and take, but what you need to believe for Solandis to get to those targets is that they can maintain double-digit EBIT margins. And the car industry in the past has not been the best steward. I think this is a company that has the ability to do that. Daniel, when it comes to how Stellantis stacks up against some of its peers, yes, it has exposure to the higher end of the business, also has exposure to more of those mass market vehicles. How are they positioned relative to some of Europe's other larger automakers? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting company because you have three big parts, right? You've got the U.S. with the trucks and large, uh, large pickups and SUVs. That's really more like a premium company. In Europe, these are small cars, mass market cars, $30,000, $35,000. They compete with uh, the Opels and the Volkswagens of the world. They're really at the lower end of European mass market. And the risk here is that Chinese competitors pushing into Europe will lower margins for everybody and also still land us in the sector. And the third bit, which is growing, is their business everywhere else, but not in China. So the Brazils and Mexicos and uh, Zimbabwe's and South Korea's of the world, that's a really strong suit. They're one of the few OEMs really focused on what they call the third engine. And using that, we think the third engine growth will offset some of the weakness in Europe in the years to come. Well, we've got you, Daniel. Also want to talk Mercedes-Benz here, specifically on this kind of luxury end of, of the auto uh, industry here. You, I mean, you likely see, after this week, Q1, likely seeing negative volume growth, bottom of the range margins as supply issues persist. How well positioned is Mercedes to get past some of those supply issues relative to the rest of the industry? I think they're about the same as everybody else. Um, what Mercedes and BMW and Porsche maybe to lump the three big European premiums together are facing is suppliers want more money, um, volumes are sluggish, and 24 will be a difficult year. What Mercedes is doing differently, though, from BMW and Porsche is that they're pushing up their vehicle in the mix. So basically, 
the C class will be a bit larger, the E class will be a bit larger, the S class will be a bit larger, making the cars more expensive and more profitable. And that's the magic in a way behind the premiumization within Mercedes over the next couple of years. I'm just trying to get back into my CLA from 2014 that my dad made me sell, Daniel, when I moved to New York. I got here with a fresh uh, MTA pass once I got up here. <laughs> Appreciate the time. Daniel Ruska, thanks. Uh, thanks. Bye. Bye, Shana. Bye. All your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. I'm not salty. We're ending the show today with some tremendous, exciting news. Our new Closing Bell show, Market Domination, is launching this Monday from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern Time. The show's going to bring you all of your market action. From today's top stories to Yahoo Finance's trending tickers to the macroeconomic forces shaping markets, Julie Hyman and Josh Lipton digging deeper into everything that you need to know for the last hour of trading. Julie and Josh joining us now with the three things to expect from Market Domination, guys. Hey, thanks, you all. We're going to bring you a fast-paced show with all the market action you need to know an hour ahead of the close, including Yahoo Finance's biggest movers, trending tickers, and sector analysis. Now we're going to bring you our playbook where Wall Street strategists and analysts tell you everything you need to know at the end of the trading day. And finally, it doesn't end there. From 4 to 4.30, we'll bring you market domination over time because the day doesn't end when the market closes. From the closing bell to breaking news from our biggest tickers, this is a half hour you don't want to miss. 
And we will not miss it. It all kicks off on Monday, 3 p.m. Eastern time here, and obviously critical hour as we count down to that closing bell and then overtime. Can I help with the theme song for Market Domination, guys? I've just really been excited and revved up for that. So I just need your permission yeah. to get started on something. Of course. Do it up. Wonderful. You've got five days. I've got GarageBand loaded up on my laptop right now. Julie Hyman, Josh Lipton, thanks so much. Let's take a quick check of the markets here. We've got a down day for the Dow, the S&P 500, and the NASDAQ. The Dow right now, it's down by about two-tenths of a percent. S&P 500, you're seeing that lower by about one-tenth of a percent. The NASDAQ composite, you're seeing declines there to the tune of about half a percent. Big consumer type of week here that we've been tracking, of course, over the course of this week, leading up to the PCE print tomorrow. Certainly, and we're seeing that reflection within the sector action today. You've got consumer discretionary among the outperformers in today's trading action, along with financials and industrials. In terms of what is under pressure today, healthcare, technology, and communication services, the worst performing sectors in the S&P 500. Well, that does it for us today here on Yahoo Finance, but keep it right here because Rochelle and Akiko have you for the next hour. We'll see you tomorrow.
Welcome to Yahoo Finance. It is 11 a.m. on the East Coast, 8 a.m. on the West. I'm Akiko Fujita, and here's why I'm watching this hour. Bitcoin continuing its climb, pushing above $60,000 for the first time since 2021. The potential catalyst that could put the crypto asset within reach of record highs. Falling back to Earth, shares of Virgin Galactic and Rocket Lab on the decline here on disappointing results, even as both companies make progress towards their next launches. How to position your portfolio for the larger space race. And EVs versus hybrids. We're going to take a look at the best vehicles for road trips in our week-long travel guide. Why plug-ins are taking the reins in the face of higher gas prices and range anxiety. First, though, let's take a look at where markets are trading. We are 90 minutes into the trading day on this Wednesday. And take a look. Red arrows across the board right now. The Dow now down for a third straight day. Down about 60 points there. The S&P 500 trading flat and the NASDAQ down roughly 60 as well. Of course, investors really keeping their close watch on data out tomorrow on the Fed's preferred inflation gauge PCE. So a bit of a holding pattern, you could argue, where the markets are today. Let's take a look at where Treasury uh, market is right now. Uh, yields all pushing lower there as well. The 10-year yield at 4.29% and the 30-year yield at 442 Well, the Bitcoin bull raging on. Topping $60,000 today. The currency surging to levels not seen in more than two years. For more on what we can expect from Bitcoin and its alternatives, let's bring in Jared Blickery, who's been tracking all the moves in the crypto space for us today. Jared. Akiko, I think a picture is worth a thousand words. You can see on the big board behind me with the Wi-Fi Interactive, we are looking at a huge rally. Bitcoin up 7.42% over the last 24 hours, over the last three days. So this week up 18%. And as you said, we are approaching those highs that we had uh, only two years ago. In fact, I think 65,000 is probably the last real resistance. But I've been getting those price alerts late at night, and we have just been peeling through, punching through uh, resistance level after resistance level. And like I said, after 65,000, uh, you got the record highs at 69,000. But I think everybody's going to be thinking about 100,000 and what that means for cryptocurrencies. Now, if we take a look at some of the crypto stocks that have been rallying, and let me put this on a three-day view here so you can see what's been happening the entire week. Uh, MicroStrategy up 42%. Uh, this is a five-year chart, and you can see MicroStrategy is racing towards those rec those highs that it had a couple of years ago. Interestingly, if I put a max chart on, you're going to see the highs that we had in the last century, late 90s, actually quite a bit higher. So uh, that company has been around quite a while. But even another, which is a relatively new entrance to the field, like Coinbase, uh, its record high was set roughly uh, after its IPO, which also coincided coincided with the uh, the high that we had in Bitcoin, it has now clawed back about 50% of its losses. And if it can punch through this, uh, looks like 215, 225 resistance level, it has a good shot at reaching those record highs. So we're seeing the crypto rally uh, broaden not only into uh, crypto stocks, but also some of the other tokens. Uh, I got a couple I got a couple seconds left, so I just want to show you real quick here. On the top line, haven't talked about Dogecoin in a while. Uh, the three-year chart admittedly does not good look good, but over the last year, you can see kind of choppy, and now it's trying to get on to its own 52-week high. So even some of the laggards here finally catching up to the generals. Okay, we'll see. I don't know, 100,000 seems a little early to call, but certainly Bitcoin bulls it out there up on with you. some pretty high targets there. It does. Jared Blickery, thanks so much for that. Well, stocks edging lower today as investors await the Fed's preferred inflation gauge out tomorrow. Any sign of prices reaccelerating sure to push back expectations for an interest rate cut from the Fed. But our next guest says that may not be enough to pull back stocks. He says we are in a Teflon market where bad news just doesn't stick. To break it down for us, we've got Young Yuma, BMO Wealth Management, U.S. Chief Investment Officer. Uh, it's good to talk to you. A Teflon market, but I have a hard time thinking that if that inflation print comes in much hotter than expected, we're not going to see a big reaction from the market. Hi, hey, Kiko. It's great to be here. Um, we actually did see two already somewhat difficult inflation prints with CPI and PPI already this month. 
The PCE inflation, of course, that is a Fed's preferred measure. It's true if it comes in much hotter, I think that would give the markets pause. But so far, the market's been able to shake off a lot of these uh, inflation prints have come up so far because some of the forward-looking measures of inflation still look pretty good in terms of inflation moderating going forward. So it's still a backward-looking measure that's important to keep in mind, and some of the forward-looking measures still look favorable. When you talk about the market really being able to shake off some of these disappointing um, or hotter than expected inflation print, other disappointing data, is it more about the the sort of tech trade this huge enthusiasm around AI overshadowing that? Or, I mean, how do you how do you make sense of the kind of reaction that we've been seeing in the market? Or is it about just this bumpy road on the rate to a rate on the road to a rate cut largely being baked in already? I think it's a little bit of both. The market still is expecting rate cuts, even if they are pushed out. Uh, to happen later this year and probably into next year as well. Uh, but it's also a lot of enthusiasm about AI and just productivity in general. The technological improvements and the prospect for companies being able, able to improve productivity, improve their profit margins. A lot of people are thinking there could be a replay of the mid-1990s where we had strong productivity growth, where we had relatively low inflation and we had market gains for several years in a row. So I think that's right now the combination of that that's allowing the market to shake off some of these near-term uh, challenges that have arisen, both uh, inflation challenges, the Fed pushing out rate cuts, uh, geopolitical concerns. Of course, the market's ability to do this is not unlimited, but so far it has proven quite resilient and able to shake off a lot of these concerns and really focus on some of the optimistic areas that things could play out uh, over the next year or so. On that optimism, you've been in the soft landing camp for some time now. As you look ahead to the second half of the year, uh, how are you shaking up that portfolio? Do you stay the course with this expectation that there could be a rate cut come June, maybe a little later? Or is now the time to add some exposure to other areas? Well, now's the time to certainly think about adding exposure. If people have been in their portfolios relatively cautious, we know a lot of investors have done that uh, because of, they've been concerned about uh, the prospect of a recession happening uh, at any moment, right? The recession uh, has been expected for quite some time and kept being pushed out. And we've been talking about a soft landing uh, for over 14 months now. And we do think that investors that might be underinvested should certainly think about uh, adding to the equity markets here. But we are optimistic about the second half of the year. We think the prospect for improved productivity, growth, adding to profit margins, um, adding to gains in the market, along with some reacceleration of corporate spending and also stability in consumer spending. We think there's enough in the mix here that even if we just get a few rate cuts this year by the Fed, that's going to provide a pretty healthy environment for risk taking this year. So how are you advising clients? Where do they increase exposure? Well, the areas we like most, uh, we think U.S. equities are, are still a good place to be. We don't think that valuation is something that uh, is extreme to the point where people should be avoiding U.S. Equi equities. We like uh, technology in terms of sectors. We like biotech. We've been very positive on U.S. infrastructure uh, for quite some time now, and we think that still has a long runway ahead of it. But we're also looking internationally. We've continued to like uh, Japanese equities for some time because of the structural changes that are taking place in Japan that we think will have also provide years of runway and a tailwind for the equity markets in Japan. So there are different areas that we think provide a favorable risk reward here that we're trying to lean into a bit. We've heard about that Japan trade for some time now. We saw the Nikkei break its record last week. I mean, how much higher do you think things can go there, um, given the economic fundamentals, while you know understanding why we are seeing so much optimism around changes in corporate governance there? Yeah, it's important to think about uh, some of the softness we've seen recently in Japanese economic data. We did have two negative quarters in a row of uh, GDP prints, and we'll probably have a soft GDP number uh, growth number this coming quarter in Japan as well. But really, a lot of that is in the rearview mirror. We think some of the changes taking place that we're seeing signs of improved uh, wage growth that looks like it should add to consumer spending in Japan. A lot of the Japanese companies that drive the major indices are global companies. 
So really exposed to more to global markets and Japanese markets. Uh, but really, if you look at the main prospect, it is that improvement in uh, shareholder friendliness, corporate governance, returning capital to shareholders. Japanese companies are sitting on a tremendous amount of cash that gives them a lot of leeway to uh, improve returns to shareholders and redistribute capital uh, to shareholders in terms of dividends and buybacks. And we think that is a long way to go still. Young Yuma, BMO Wealth Management, U.S. Chief Investment Officer. Good to talk to you today. Appreciate the time. Thanks, Kiko. Well, Apple is hitting the brakes on its Apple car project. The tech giant reportedly scrapping its multi-billion dollar plan to produce an electric vehicle. We've got our very own Dan Halley on the case for us today. Dan, you know, Apple really never did come out publicly and, and establish what it is they were doing with this EV project. But what does this say, this decision reportedly to scrap this, say about where Apple feels like they need to prioritize right now? Yeah, I mean, the, the Project Titan, uh, as, as it was called, uh, has been rumored for, for quite some time. Apple never came out, uh, as you said, with any kind of official statement on it, but they were uh, seen driving around test vehicles, uh, not you know any prototypes or anything, uh, but trying to collect data uh, on self-driving capabilities. The, originally, the car was going to be fully autonomous. Uh, the idea, according to uh, Bloomberg, was that it would have no steering wheel, no pedals or anything like that. You would just basically be in, you know, like a kind of limo style car uh, and it would drive you from place to place. Turns out that's a little bit harder uh, than they expected. Pretty much the entire auto industry is realizing that now. Uh, and so they were going to do uh, kind of a high-end driver assistant technology um, to basically allow you to maybe take your hands off the wheel for a second or two, but it would still have a, a steering wheel uh, and pedal. But, you know, it seems as though the, the whole uh, ability for them to get an EV out, to get it off the ground, the amount of, of pain and suffering that a company would have had to gone through to do this. You know, we, we saw Tesla, obviously, uh, on the brink of collapse at points, uh, Rivian struggling to get uh, themselves up and going uh, and producing vehicles. It, it seems like it was too it, it was it was too costly for what they were hoping to eventually get it would have eaten into margins compared to what they have now uh, with their uh, the iPhone and, and other products as well as their services so now it looks like what they're going to do is focus more on uh, generative AI and AI uh, tools in general yeah it's, it's interesting it, it seems as though Apple was kind of caught off guard compared to Microsoft uh, Google uh, Amazon meta you know uh, Google, Amazon, and Meta seemingly caught off guard by Microsoft's huge investment right out of the gate and the products that they're pushing now, but Apple even more so. Uh, and so it looks as though that's what they're going to be uh, putting the, the, the workers to work on now who are on the project, uh, according to this report. And that could pay dividends in the end if they're able to come up with some kind of software that really kind of energizes uh, the, the iPhone, uh, the Apple Watch, things like that, and gets people interested in what uh, generative AI has to offer. So far though, it's, it's really just been chat GPT and nothing else. Yeah, so let's stay on that point because Tim Cook did in its most recent earnings call for Apple, uh, you know, talk about the fact that generative AI features are coming to Apple devices later this year, uh, surely responding to investor frustration about maybe Apple being behind the ball. But, you know, we've gotten a lot of announcements around the integration of Gen AI technology. But at the end of the day, as you said, we haven't seen anything that matches what OpenAI has done with ChatGPT. Yeah, exactly. And you where's know, this all going? I, I, I think we're, we're we're at this point where uh, some of the experts I spoke to have called it kind of a you know throwing spaghetti at the wall kind of moment for for generative AI, where we're just going to see what sticks. We're going to try all of these different experiments uh, and see if anything actually pays off uh, as as a viable product that people really want and enjoy. It, we're seeing that kind of across the board. I mean, you know, uh, Wendy's. Uh, is using generative AI at their, uh, you know, drive-through window. Uh, Walmart's using generative AI. Uh, Amazon's doing it on their their, their uh, retail site. Uh, you know, Microsoft obviously implementing it uh, across the board when it comes to their enterprise products, as well as on uh, Windows. You know, Google. I mean, it's you know going to be seeping into everything that Google has to offer. So we're seeing all of these different offerings, but nothing 
too compelling at the moment. And it feels like uh, what the companies are trying to do is figure out what that compelling option is. Uh, they believe it's there. Uh, they, they just haven't found anything uh, quite yet that's getting people as inspired as uh, originally ChatGPT did. Sure, you have Sora, the uh, 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 open AI video uh, producing or, or generating uh, service, but you know that's not something that most people are going to be using on a daily basis. And so uh, I think at this point, the the industry is just trying to figure out where uh, generative AI fits in. And you know, one of the, the the experts I spoke to had said, "Look, it's very similar to uh, when uh, we were seeing the the dot com boom, where everybody needed a website, uh, and they were just trying to really figure out what they were going to do with it, right? And so now, you know, obviously, there's, I mean." billions of websites all across the web, and there's different reasons for, for their existence, whether that's booking reservations for something, booking flights, uh, checking the news, uh, watching the fabulous Yahoo Finance uh, broadcast every day. There's, there's a reason for websites uh, all around, but at first there wasn't really a key specific reason for, for a lot of people to have them. It's kind of what we're getting now with generative AI, where we're going to start to see more uh, kind of products roll out, and eventually we'll get a true purpose for them. And maybe at that point, people start to buy into it a lot more. We'll see. Uh, Dan, we haven't even had a conversation about the text to video model that OpenAI released Sora. That's a whole nother conversation. Yeah. If you wonder if that's where things are going, it's going to get interesting. Dan Halley, as always, thanks so much. All your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Virgin Galactic reporting its quarterly results, missing revenue estimates, and reporting a narrower than expected loss. But the company's growth story is only just beginning. Our next guest says Virgin Galactic is positioning itself to be a key player in space tourism. For a deeper dive into those results, let's bring in Michael Leshock, Equity Research Associate Analyst at Key Bank Capital Markets. Uh, Michael, good to talk to you. We have seen a pullback in that stock today on the back of these results. What's the big headline for you coming out of the results? Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, that's a good question. So there certainly is a pullback. It's typically uh, it, it's typical to see some volatility surrounding earnings results. But for, for us, we look at the long-term story and we think that Virgin Galactic is doing a great job at positioning itself well to be a leader within the space tourism industry. So today they've successfully done six commercial launches, space flights to, uh, to space in the past six months. And when we look at scaling operations, it's gonna take their Delta class spaceships. And those are in development and production right now. And we see them coming online in 2026. So for us, it's really the long-term story that remains in focus. And you highlight specifically that the company's still on track to operate its first or final commercial service flight um, in the second quarter of this year. You talk about space tourism and where Virgin Galactic is positioned. How big is that market? Yeah, so there's a lot of questions on how big that market could be. Um, but right now, it's you, you can look at their backlog and they have ample demand really for the foreseeable future. Um, the, the market could be... Um, significantly bigger than what we have today. But again, there are a lot of unknowns around that. And I think it's just important to focus on the supply demand imbalance here because there's not a lot of people, if any, companies that are doing what Virgin Galactic can do. Um, and there's there's quite a few people in their backlog and, and more that want to buy tickets and ticket sales still have yet to reopen. So um, that's that's an important watch point for Virgin Galactic. You've got a price target on the stock of $1.90 a share. That's kind of right where we are, $1.80, a little pushing, pushing a little higher than that maybe. Um, I mean, it, it sounds like this is kind of the range we're likely to stay at based on the case that you're making here. What do you think is the biggest risk to the company right now? Yeah, so the, the biggest risks to the company today is not being able to execute on the Delta-class spaceships over the long term. Um, they're in the design development process right now with them, um, and they need to be able to hit their milestones, which is right now they're looking to do tests on Delta class in 2025 um, and then bring them into commercial service in 2026. Our view is that we think that they have the right team um, in place to be able to accomplish that. So we think it is possible, um, but that would be the risk for downside in the stock. Um, in terms of where it's at today, we're sector weight on it. Um, and we just think it's more of a timing game when we get more visibility around some of the milestones that they have with, um, with these Delta class spaceships. Uh, Michael, another stock that we're watching um, in space, related to space, is Rocket Lab also reporting their results. Uh, losses widen there, although it is right now about the buildup of this launch for their Neutron rocket. How long until space, uh, Rocket Lab can compete head-to-head -head with SpaceX on that? Yeah, so I think to some extent they're doing it today with their smaller Electron rocket. Um, but really, the important part of being able to compete with SpaceX is getting their medium lift launch vehicle, which is called Neutron, um, into production. And they're, they're scheduling their first launch for that rocket um, at the end of this year. So that's a much larger rocket than what they have currently, and it will significantly expand their total addressable market. So they'll be able to, to reach 98% of all satellites um, in, and carry them into orbit. Uh, so that's that's the significant market expansion if they're able to um, capitalize on that and complete the neutron production in time for the first launch at the end of this year. Um, now, it is rocket science, so could there be a delay? Certainly, but we don't think a delay would be that long in nature, um, given that a lot of this is based on the uh, same design as the 
the Electron rocket, their legacy <coughs> launch vehicle. Um, so, so we think that the the similarities between the two with the carbon composite design uh, in the same avionics that they're using, that's really going to help them to get this to uh, to the finish line on time. Certainly shaping up to be a very busy second half of the year. Uh, Michael Leshock, Equity Research Associate Analyst at KeyBank Capital Markets. Good to talk to you today. Thank you. Well, $60 billion aid deal for Ukraine is being blocked by conservative Republicans. House Speaker Mike Johnson saying America has to take care of its own needs first. Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman has the details. And Rick, you're calling the blocking of Ukraine aid, in your words, dumb logic. Why? <laughs> uh, I mean, it's just sophistry what we're hearing from uh, Mike Johnson and uh, other conservative Republicans. I mean, he keeps saying, as you pointed out, Akika, we need to take care of America first. In particular, they, they want uh, fixes for this huge flow of migrants at the border, as if, uh, you know, the United States government is not doing anything for Americans. Well, all we ever talk about is sending U.S. taxpayer money overseas. That is not the case at all. I mean, we, you know, the, gov the, the government's fiscal year started October 1st. The government has spent $2.1 trillion since then. Almost all of that is money spent on Americans to help Americans. The U.S. government spends $14 billion a day. A lot of that goes out in uh, Social Security payments, Med Medicare benefits, uh, and practically everybody in the country benefits from all the money the government spends uh, on a daily basis, President Biden is asking for $60 billion to uh, help Ukraine. Um, that is e equivalent to only four days worth of, spe uh, of, of spending. That's what the U.S. government spends in four days. And most of this, this, this is not money. We're not sending stacks of $100 bills to Ukraine. That's not what they want. What they desperately need is weaponry. Uh, and almost all of that is made in the United States by Americans. So I mean, what's really going on here is uh, Republicans are just trying to stoke immigration problems. They want this to be a big uh, election uh, campaign point for, for President Trump. So they actually don't, they've actually blocked bills to actually do what they say they want to do, which is fix immigration. There is legislation to do that. Republicans won't vote for it. Um, so this is just circular logic. Uh, and honestly, what Americans should get behind is just more funding for Ukraine. Rick, have to ask you about what played out yesterday in Michigan in the primary there. Of course, there was a lot of questions going into that primary for President Biden, given um, the, the huge uh, demographic of Arab Americans saying they're going to be voting uncommitted. We saw that they exceeded more than 100,000 votes there. What does that tell you about just how complicated that path is for the president in trying to capture that state, which is very much in play and critical to that November election? Well, Biden, uh, th this might be overplayed a little bit in the media. Biden still got, I think he got 81 percent of the vote uh, among Democrats. Uh, that's a pretty decisive victory. Uh, it's very clear. It's not just Arab Americans. It's young Americans uh, are not happy with Biden's um, what began as full-throated support for Israel uh, because uh, there are certainly some Americans who think Palestinians are the victims here. Uh, and, I, you know, the Biden administration is getting that message. One thing they, uh, you know, the the, uh, the State Department has recently said they oppose uh, certain new settlements in the West Bank. That is a that is a key point. Um, so they, you know, Biden is addressing these concerns. I think some of the Arab Americans in Michigan, they just want to be heard. So Biden is I think he is saying he's going to hear them. And if you have if you want to ask, what does this all mean for the general election? Um, it, it seems a little bit hard to, to believe that Arab Americans who don't love Biden's policies are going to vote for Trump uh, because Trump, remember, the, one of the first things he did when he became president in 2017 was ban Muslim immigrants, uh, you know, the Muslim ban, <clears throat> which courts struck down and said you can't do that. So it's not like these people are going to necessarily vote for uh, for Trump, but they want Biden to hear them. And I think Biden has to hear them. And that is at least what the White House has said. Um, they're going to try to earn every vote. It is has been the, the line from the White House. We'll continue to watch that. Rick Newman, thanks so much. See you, Kiko. Coming up, we'll be looking at the best ways to nav navigate the ETF market. That is coming up after this short break.
Well, the recent rally in tech is extending to ETFs. Over the last 12 months, tech ETFs have seen $17 billion in inflows. That's at least according to our next guest. With investors focused on tech and innovations in AI, what are the strongest ways to position your portfolio? Let's bring in Dave Nadek, financial futurist. He's joining us for our ETF report brought to you by Invesco QQQ. Dave, that number, $17 billion, pretty staggering. When you think about the outflows that you've highlighted, $17 billion in non-tech ETFs, what does that tell you about yeah. where the momentum is right now and how much of that can continue? Yeah, it feels like this is a little overdone, to be honest. We've seen the giant rallies in stocks like Microsoft and NVIDIA, and they've really driven not just the tech sector, but the S&P 500. They really are the stocks that are moving everything. And concentration risk is something we need to be really paying attention to, particularly with tech ETFs. So as you said, $17 billion has flowed into sort of tech sector ETFs. The big one there is XLK, the State Street Select Sector Spider uh, tech ETF. It's actually in a bit of a bind now because its top five holdings are actually more than 50% of the fund. That puts it in violation of what's called the 55 rule with the IRS. They'll have to make some adjustments there and get some of those heavyweights down. So what do you do if you're an investor and you actually want to keep leaning into technology here? I would recommend that you look for strategies that are a little bit more equal weighted or at least mitigating some of that hyper concentration so you're not 25% Microsoft not 8% in NVIDIA. Uh, I'd highlight something like the Robo Global Robotics and Automation ETF, the ticker there is ROBO. This is a very specific thematic play in AI and robotics, which let's be honest, has really been what's driving most of these tech headlines. There you're getting a much more balanced, equal weight, sort of 80 to 85 stock portfolio. You're getting global diversification, so it's not just a handful of stocks. And you're getting some of the use cases, not just the folk making the chips, but folks like Daifuku in Japan or Siemens in Germany that are actually taking what we're getting out of AI and putting it to work in American factories, global factories, logistics, transportation. That's where this is really going to make a difference in the economy is when we actually take some of this technology and get it to work. Dave, you know you're going to have investors out there, though, that say it's kind of tough to part with the returns that we've been getting in these concentrated stocks. Um, to what extent have you started to see that broaden out, the AI play? Well, the concentration issue is always going to be a bit of a performance conundrum because, I mean, just look at the top of the tech stack right now. Microsoft is 23, 25 percent of most big tech ETFs. Obviously, that means if Microsoft's having a good week, your performance is going to beat everybody else. But that's a bit of a canard. It's a bit of a mirage because obviously it works exactly the same way on a down day. Uh, so I'm generally never a fan of these hyper-concentrated portfolios. Look, if you want to own a ton of Microsoft, that's easy to buy too. Just go buy a ton of Microsoft. I really think that investors should be focused on longer-term plays where you can find those companies and pockets of the economy that really benefit over the cycle, not just over the headline. So that's why I'd lean into something like RoboGlobal. It's going to underperform on any day that NVIDIA and Microsoft are the only story. Dave, we, we have admittedly been talking a lot about tech on this show, but you say the sector that everybody should be talking about is healthcare. What do you like there? Well, so healthcare has been interesting. It's the best performing of the S&P 500 sectors this year so far. And effectively, nobody's talking about it except for occasionally a few headlines about a Zempic. Uh, and that is one of the big stories. The GLP-1 drugs are a big story. Cancer research has really been taking off, uh, and there's some great plays there. I do think you need somebody with real expertise in the space. I think this is one of those corners of the market that's a little tough to index. I like a uh, fund by Simplify. Their Simplify Healthcare ETF is called PINK, P-I-N-K. Uh, that's an actively managed fund. Uh, run by a guy named Mike Taylor, who's a, a, a storied investor in the space, has run long, short hedge funds in healthcare for years. Uh, and this is a fund where he's making very specific picks about where he thinks the market's going. 
And he's been beating the core indexes in healthcare very consistently since this fund launched in 2021. I think he's up over the last 12 months. He's been beating the core index by three or four um, percent. So great track record so far, but more importantly, a really intentional portfolio that's getting you exposure to some of those more interesting biotech and pharma names without just veering entirely in that direction, but neither avoiding the more traditional healthcare plays either. So I think it gets you that nice balance. Uh, another little side benefit of Pink is that they donate all the profits to the Susan G. Komen Foundation for Cancer Research. So you're kind of getting a double whammy there. You're not only going to get to profit from the advances we're making in that kind of research, you're also going to get to help out. Some good takeaways there as always. Dave Nodig, financial futurist. Good to talk to you today. Appreciate the time. Thanks for having me. Coming up, should you take a gas-powered car or an EV on your next road trip? We're going to break down the option for you as part of Yahoo Finance's Travel Guide 2024 Industry Insights. It's a jam-packed hour focusing on the biggest movers and shakers on Wall Street. This is market domination, and here, every day is game day. We have one hour left until the market close. It's game time for investors to make their final plays. The clock is ticking, and we've got you covered with our quarter-by-quarter -quarter playbook. We're bringing you in on all the market action. With step-by-step -step analysis of our biggest trending tickers. And expert insight into the day's biggest headlines. We'll bring you the closing bell and get you to the finish line. This is Market, market Domination. Domination. Tune in daily from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern. Yahoo Finance's Travel Guide talks all things planes, trains, and automobiles, and we really can't forget about that last one. EVs were again the talk of the town in 2023, as the likes of Tesla, GM, and Ford tried to keep pace in the race for market share. With the growth of BYD and the battle for the global consumer, where do we stand now? EVs may be in vogue, but we can't talk autos without discussing gas prices. They came back down to earth last year after rocketing in 2022. So can we keep the price at the pump down? Will it entice consumers to buy their next car and drive across the country? Are they doing it in a gas guzzler or in an EV? Lots of questions and Yahoo Finance's Travel Guide 2024 Industry Insights drives the conversation on what to expect in 2024.
34% of Americans who are vacationing this year plan to take a road trip. Now there are so many options for consumers out there outside of the usual gas-powered car. Joining us now as part of Yahoo Finance's Travel Guide 2024 Industry Insights is our very own Praz Subramanian. Praz, something tells me you're going to stick to plug-ins, not necessarily EVs for a road trip. Yeah, I think plug -in so. Plug-in hybrids, I should say. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, there, you have hybrids that are plug-ins and not not plug-ins and, and have uh, more electric power compared to the others. But yeah, I mean, traditionally speaking, you know, a road trip, look, with an EV, it's going to be a bit more difficult in terms of finding those charging stations across the highway. With Tesla, you might have a better opportunity there with the, with the supercharger network. But yeah, looking at cars, you know, looking at hybrids and plug-ins, you know, Consumer Reports had, they had a big report out yesterday talking about these cars and noting, noting that hybrids and plug-in hybrids have been getting better over the years, better technology, um, quieter, uh, more performance, uh, better efficiency and things like that. And they, and they broke down a sort of a comparison here. You can see this right now with an EV versus a, a, an equivalent plug-in hybrid. So in this case, we're looking at, I believe, the Kia Nero, right? And, then, and when they did a kind of study on how people actually travel and what their fuel costs or electrical costs would be, in this case, the plug-in hybrid, the PHEV, Nero beats out the EV when it comes to actually running costs. So we see that there. The next example is the Hyundai Tucson, which you'll see in the next, in the next screen. And that's a hybrid, traditional hybrid versus a PHEV. And guess what? In this case, the hybrid uh, is beating the PHEV. Now, I will say that this has to do with how the car is being used. So if you're doing a lot of highway driving, the PHEV will probably run out uh, or probably not be going electric so much and that hybrid will actually give you more uh, efficiency. But if you're doing a lot of city driving, the PHEV is going to be in all electric mode most of the time and you'll really save there in terms of energy prices. And finally, the last example is the BMW 3 Series, the, the, the sort of uh, standard bearer there in the sedan market. The PHEV, again, beats out the traditional gas-powered car here. Not surprising. You're going to get that extra efficiency, that electric boost that'll improve or help your uh, mileage there. Press, do we have any idea, you know, how available these cars are through rentals? I mean, we've talked a lot about, you know, companies like Hertz really slashing their fleet around electric vehicles. Road trip typically requires, typically you're out renting a car first before you head out on the road. What's the availability like? You know, I, I would argue that there's probably more EVs than PHEVs uh, on the rental fleets uh, at currently. And now, we, we, like you said, you mentioned Hertz cutting their fleet. They still have several thousand EVs in their fleet, but I think... But prior to that, most traditional car rental companies were buying gas-powered cars, maybe a hybrid. The PHEVs were a bit more expensive and a bit more uh, kind of finicky with how you deal with it. You're not going to see or trust a, a car rental uh, uh, consumer to plug that in at night. Where are they going to do that? So I think you might see more traditional hybrids and maybe even more EVs now. But the plug-in hybrid was not part of the traditional car rental fleet. And I think you, maybe you might see that change a bit as people become more accustomed to how those things work. You know, Akiko, it's funny you mentioned uh, one of the, the, the best-selling plug-in hybrid is the Jeep Wrangler PHEV and also the, the Grand Cherokee. It turns out a huge percentage of those users did not even know that you can plug in that car to actually flip the battery. I, I, I'm telling you, that's what dealers have told people like me <laughs> and others. So there needs to be some education, too. Yeah, education certainly key in that transition to electric. Proud Supermanian, thanks so much for that. Well, gas prices ticking slightly higher today following the upward trend we've been seeing over the last month, according to Gas Buddy. As we head into peak travel season, how should road trippers factor gas prices into their plans? Joining us now, it's part of Yahoo Finance's Travel Guide 2024 Industry Insights. We've got Patrick DeHaan, Gas Buddy Head of Petroleum Analysis. Patrick, always good to talk to you today. What does that trajectory look like as we go into the peak travel season or peak road trip season in terms of gas prices? Well, Kiko, this is the time of year when we tend to see more bumps in the road ahead with rising gas prices. All of that really due to the seasonal ups and downs. Right now, the ups, refinery maintenance, a more costly summer uh, version of gasoline coming into view. And rising demand all set the stage for gas prices that could rise another 20 to 50 cents a gallon between now and, say, Memorial Day. But all in all, it's probably not going to be quite as high as what we've seen the last couple of years. That's because some of the imbalances like COVID and Russia's war in Ukraine have faded to the rear view. Prices still remain a bit elevated. Inflation is still running higher than expectations, and that's keeping pressure on gas prices. But uh, it's not going to be the worst summer to hit the road.
Yeah, that's a good start, at least for planning uh, some of the summer travel. You said peak demand or not looking specifically at demand. There's obviously the global picture we look at um, that tracks gas prices. There's also the demand domestically. And I wonder, Patrick, Praz was talking about how drivers are increasingly looking at plug-in hybrid EVs or, you know, full, fully electric EVs. Um, how much of that has affected demand tied to road trips or just tied to the peak travel season for gas? Well, I think that's certainly starting to come into view as the number of EVs and even things like PHEVs have increased. Gasoline demand is nowhere near record levels. In fact, even right now, it's still kind of seasonally low, although demand is going up. And I think over time, more of the reason why we're seeing gasoline demand far below record levels is because of this transition, which has accelerated significantly and likely will continue. Gasoline demand right now, only about 8.5 million barrels a day, actually, according to the government, 8.4. I would say normal for this time of year, if you would take out EVs, would probably be somewhere in the upper eight. So I think it's having more of a dent on gasoline demand, and that probably will continue here uh, as long as the White House and whoever is in the White House continues to view EVs favorably. There will be plenty of incentives to increase those number of EVs on the roads. There's obviously the, the, the question about charging and other issues that pop up with driving a, a battery um, electric car. But I wonder if you've done a cost comparison at all, if you're just even looking at hybrids versus a, an ICE car, traditional ICE car. Is there a, a meaningful cost difference here? If there's drivers out there who are saying, look, looking at where gas prices are tracking, which option should I go with? Yeah, and there's a lot of different ways to slice this. For example, what type of vehicle, where you are, California's gasoline prices are notoriously high, hovering just below the $5 a gallon mark. So in an area like California, where there is a lot of infrastructure for charging EVs, it can be much more cost advantageous to have an EV in California than, say, in the middle of Wyoming, where they lack the infrastructure. Generally speaking, EVs are going to have lower energy costs. That is, instead of gasoline, electricity tends to be cheaper. Uh, and also, maintenance costs on EVs tends to be lower. But up front, the cost of an EV tends to be much more expensive. So studies like from the University of Michigan have found that over the long run, having an EV can save you $8,000 over the course of 200,000 miles. But as Press mentioned, there's a lot of different use cases. So if you're on the highway more often than in the city, you may be better off going with a, a hybrid or a plug-in uh, electric vehicle. So a lot of dynamics here, but EVs do have some benefits, though I think in, in what he was mentioning, plug-in hybrid electric vehicles are really filling the void. Americans, uh, some of them, uh, don't want to make the jump right into a 100% electric vehicle right away, and PHEVs are certainly providing uh, some of the benefits, lower maintenance and certainly lower costs of filling up with electricity as long as you can remain within those relatively smaller battery ranges. Yeah, it, it's the comfort of having gas as the backup within the car. Um, finally, as we look to peak travel season, you know, you talked about where gas prices could be tracking. Where do you think viewers should be looking for looking at for as key catalysts that could push prices higher? Well, I think right now the Middle East is something that we continue to watch, though there hasn't been much impact. Oil prices have still struggled. The Middle East certainly could change. We've seen situations where things drastically change overnight. And of course, there's a lot of crude oil being produced in the Middle East. Seasonally, though, I'm looking much more at refineries. This is the time of year that there's a lot of pressure on refineries. They're doing maintenance before the summer. They're transitioning over to summer gasoline. And in the background, demand is all going up at the same time. And that puts a lot of pressure on refineries to finish that maintenance, to get back online and boost production. And just like taking an old car and to get an oil change, there can be issues at refineries that are unexpected that can lengthen the downtime. So it's all about refineries as we make the transition to summer gasoline. Then in the summer, a lot of those pressures ease. And then we look towards the Atlantic and hurricane season. But Hopefully, we'll have a little bit more breathing room at the refining level this year, as there have been increases in global refining capacity over the last couple of years. Well, Patrick, we always appreciate your perspective. Patrick DeHaan, Gas Buddy, Head of Petroleum Analysis. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Well, coming up, Disney and Reliance Industries announcing a new joint venture and more media news. That is coming up after this short break.
Disney and Reliance Industries are forming a joint venture that will combine Viacom 18 and Star India and heighten regulatory scrutiny in this space over in India. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Ali Canal, who's been following this story for us. And Ali, um, some context here. Of course, Reliance Industries, the top conglomerate for India. Um, how much of this is enough to stop that exodus we've been seeing from Disney's streaming service there? Yeah, and, and you know, Kiko, this is a deal that has been in the works for some time now. Now we have a little more color on this agreement. And according to the two companies, Reliance is Viacom 18 going to merge with Disney's Star India business. The deal is estimated to be worth $8.5 billion on a, quote, post-money basis. Now, Reliance is going to invest about $1.4 billion into the joint venture in order to boost its growth strategy. The merger does value the India business of Disney at just around a quarter of the $15 billion valuation, that is what Disney acquired it for as part of that Fox deal in 2019. Uh, so this is, you know, a, a big moment for Disney when you think about where it currently stands, right? I mean, the company is going through a big transition. CEO Bob Iger, he has been committed to really streamlining the business, especially as the stock price has been under pressure. We also have uh, further pressure from Nelson Peltz and a lot of those activist investors investors out there. So, and, you know, when we think about the India business as well, Disney has been bleeding money when it comes to those subscribers, nearly $3 billion in rights fees for a lot of those cricket matches. That's something that Reliance ended up taking over and paying, which led to a, 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 the bleeding of subscribers there for the hot star business. So looking ahead, Disney says it wants to remain in India. It is not a market that it wants to leave at the current moment, but clearly a move had to be made at this current juncture, and, and we'll see where this leads Disney down the line. And Ali, we've got the Paramount reporting today, the last of the streaming giants to report here amid a lot of speculation about the sale of their assets. What are we likely to hear? Yeah, so m and obviously is going to be a big question mark for investors. There's been a lot of chatter when it comes to the future of Paramount's business, but there's also a significant amount of uh, metrics that investors will be keeping their eye on. One being whether or not Paramount can continue to push towards profitability in its direct-to-consumer business. The company is expected to to report a DTC loss of $534 million. That's wider than the loss seen in the third quarter, but a slight improvement on a year-over-year -year basis. In terms of subscribers, Paramount Plus is expected to add 3.8 million net additions. It currently boasts more than 63 million total subscribers. And then on the TV side, we'll likely continue to see a slump in linear ad revenue and licensing revenue, while free cash flow should once again be strong in the quarter due to the since-concluded Hollywood strikes, helping to boost that metric a little bit. Uh, but Paramount, you know, another company trying to right-size its business. It recently laid off 800 employees. It will likely tout the strength of its live events programming on CBS, like the Super Bowl, NFL playoffs, and the Grammys on the call. But investors really want to know, what's Paramount's future here? What does the financial outlook look like for this company? CNBC did report yesterday that Warner Brothers Discovery is no longer interested in acquiring Paramount. But we still have that bid from Byron Allen on the table. Skydance Media is still in its due diligence period. And even Yahoo Finance's parent company, Apollo Global, has been rumored as a potential buyer here. So all options seem to be on the table. CEO Bob Bakish said the company is open to deal making. It's just a question of when and ultimately in what capacity. Okay, well, I'll be watching to see what Paramount has to say there. Ali Canal, as always, thanks so much for that. That does it for me in the 11 a.m. Eastern hour as we look at all three major indices in the red heading into the noon hour. Much more to come here on Yahoo Finance. Keep it right here.